why you think they're a good idea or a bad idea. Um, we'll take testimony uh, from those that are for each bill. Uh, then we'll take testimony from those opposed and then by those that are neither for nor against. We ask folks to keep their comments to three minutes if possible. Um, and then we'll have time to ask questions uh, of each of each person if uh, there are questions from members of the committee. I'd like to also remind everybody that we are um, being broadcast uh, live on YouTube as well as um, uh, through Zoom. Um, all of our comments are, are public record. Everything's recorded and broadcast on the internet. Uh, for members of the public that haven't signed up yet, uh, if you'd like to speak on any of these bills, so please uh, um, sign up through our uh, committee clerk, Avery Page. Um, and so with that, I guess we will um, begin with, um, I don't have the bills here in front of me, but uh, we'll start with a president, uh, Senate President Jackson, who's here to introduce um, uh, the first bill. Is President Jackson with us? Do you know if he's with us, Avery? Is he gonna be? I'm not seeing him on yet. I know he did want to speak first because he had a scheduling issue. So we. He's coming in. Oh, there he is. It. Hello. Welcome, President Jackson. Well, thank you. We've been watching you get going here. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. My name is Troy Jackson, and I have the great honor of serving as the president of the Maine Senate, and I also proudly represent District 1 in Northern Arista County, stretching from Caribou North to the St. John Valley. As, a mem as members of this committee, uh, you probably know, and I believe Representative Matlack uh, educated me uh, last year on the true meaning of cabotage. Uh, the, my experience is working in the logging industry in Northern Maine uh, initially led me to run for the legislature many years ago. I believe then, as I do now, that Maine loggers and truckers face an uphill battle competing against their counterparts in Canada. We benefit from a favorable exchange rate and government-sponsored health insurance. This dynamic has depressed wages for Maine people working in the woods and handed large landowners extraordinary power in the industry. The bill I'm presenting today is an attempt to correct yet another injustice to Maine workers. Throughout my time in the industry, we've been told that Canadian truck drivers are not allowed to practice what is now referred to as cabotage, or point-to-point -point truck loads in the United States. It is generally accepted that drivers are allowed to deliver international shipments into the U.S. and then pick up a load to be delivered back to Canada. However, at no time can a driver deliver their initial load in the U.S. and then pick up a subsequent load in the U.S. and deliver that load to a destination within this country. Taken as a whole, my conversations over the past few years with the Maine Department of Labor, Customs Directors in Marissa County, Maine Port Authority, and others have made it clear is that there's real confusion as to why the federal government is allowing the practice of H-2A visa program. It's my understanding that the H-2A visas exist to allow farms to have short-term workers pick crops that would spoil the fields if they were not harvested in a timely manner. Under this scenario, truck drivers would be moving products in the fields and possibly to a processing or storage facility not far from those fields. Let me assure you, that trees in Maine are not spoiling in the fields. In fact, the older and bigger they get, the more profitable they become. I strongly believe that H-2A visas were not intended for this purpose. And to allow this practice is at completely at odds with Homeland Security rules on cabotage. There is absolutely no way that Maine workers can compete with this interpretation of federal law. Allowing drivers in this industry to misuse the H-2A program also flies in the face of one of the overarching principles of allowing H-2A visas in this country. And that is to protect the wages and working conditions of U.S. workers. 
This issue has only become more glaring than ever during the pandemic when Maine wood haulers need more work than ever. Last summer, I filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Labor concerning the practice of cabotage in the logging industry in northern Maine. As some of you may have read, I also spent a day with a reporter from the Bangor Daily News to highlight the problem and bring attention to the lack of enforcement over this breach of federal law. This bill is before you based on the amendment that passed this committee with bipartisan support in the last legislature just before we adjourned due to the pandemic. The proposal recognizes the need for our state to take a stand for Maine workers in the logging industry by ensuring that large landowners respect federal law on the practice of cabotage. Any landowner that owns 50,000 or more acres of forest land and allows the practice of cabotage with products harvested on their land becomes ineligible for the Maine tree growth tax law following two previous violations. So you would have to show a pattern of disregard for the federal law before you would even have to worry about losing your tree growth uh, benefit. Additionally, those landowners engaged in the practice may not receive certain tax incentives, state grants, or state funding. I also want to note that my staff and I have worked with Maine Revenue Services to address some of the potential clarifications and concerns they have had with the language as written. The major concerns were around who would handle prosecution, enforcement of the violations, and the severity and length of ineligibility for state tax credits and grants funds. As the committee works this bill, I want to make the following suggestions to help clarify some of these concerns. The prosecuting authority for landowners violations of cabotage should be housed under the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Currently, the Department of Labor has an MOU with VACF for them to do inspections. And the department always has, already has uh, their forest rangers um, that do timber trespass, timber theft, and all these different things. So it certainly fits in line with the enforcement arm of the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry. The language that would be enacted in section two, 10 MSRA section 2364B, in subsection seven regarding the prohibition around transport should be directed in a way that the landowner positively affirms that the transport is legal. This could potentially be done using a box on their trip tickets where the landowner verifies that the transport is legal. And I'll show you some of these trip tickets in a moment. The, the length of the removal of a landowner from the main tree growth tax law should be two years following the ineligibility from the program. That's in lines 30 and 33. I certainly think that two years uh, shows that this is a serious issue and, and draws attention to something that people have consistently uh, thumbed their nose at. For the language regarding the loss of state awarded grants or state funds, lines 34 and 37, should be clarified to mean only business grants or state funding, not personal grants or state funding to an individual landowner, for example. For example, if a business entity otherwise qualified a carbon reduction grant, but received a third violation of cabotage law, that entity would be disqualified for the program for two years following in a similar fashion to the length of time that they would be disqualified from the main tree growth tax law. For far too long, main workers in this industry have faced challenge after challenge. This bill asks landowners to do some very simple things, follow federal law as it relates to the practice of cabotage, and recognize that the misuse of H2A program, uh, and make sure that they give main workers a fair shot. So I have a slideshow, but I wanted to explain to you why we put together this slideshow since, well, I mean, really since my whole life, but maybe just since uh, Friday. I've heard an awful lot from the industry and the department and the administration about how this is not happening, 
And then when I explain to people how it is happening and that there's documented proof of it, then it's, well, there's a lack of trackers, which makes no difference if there is or not. The, the law is the law, and it's up to this state to make sure that there's enforcement of that. I also hear from the department that says that landowners have no control over this issue, which is a complete farce. I, I understand the industry very well, and, and landowners dictate to people all the time where to go on a daily basis, where to haul, where to pick up, and where they're going to deliver. The idea that they don't know who is picking up this lumber at any one time in any one day is a complete joke. That that is not at all how this uh, this operates. And I also read in the department's testimony that it makes no logical sense to to tie these things together. Well, I believe you're going to hear from Representative Myron, who actually instituted the tree growth program. This was the very reason why we gave a tree growth tax break was to keep uh, land and forest products production. So if the harvesting and hauling of forest products is not at least tied to the tree growth program, then I don't know what else is. But, but the reality is that this has been a long-term problem that has consistently been brought forward by people. And, and obviously this is a big hammer to swing, but I think it's time that landowners understood that this is not, not something that, that can uh, be swept under the rug. You know, and, and, and I can provide for the department, but in 2017, after a number of years of fighting with Governor LePage, you know, I invited him to come to Northern Maine and meet uh, with the loggers up there. And, and to my surprise, he took that opportunity and came. And, and you know, there was probably 80, 85 people that spoke there and spoke extensively about this issue. I mean, it's, it's documented, it's, uh, it's filmed, Susan Sharon, NPR was there, you know, and, and what was striking to me at that time was one of the landowner industry people showed up, and even though I asked them if they would leave so that people could speak freely without the fear of reprisal, and they wouldn't, people still spoke about, about this issue in front of them. And, and the, the issue is, is, under that administration, and under this administration, people are not taking this seriously. And there's only so many times that somebody's going to stick their neck out before they're going to get it chopped off and quit speaking. You know, the, the, this weekend I heard from a former classmate of mine that uh, her husband is a large contractor for one of these landowners. And she told me that she was wanting to know if I knew of anywhere where they could get cheap uh, health insurance, because she couldn't uh, probably drive uh, to her job anymore, uh, in, you know, before she turns in the uh, 60s, become, you know, her age. That's what's going on in the industry is that oftentimes, um, you know, husband and wife team, the wife picks up the health insurance. Uh, for the, for the couple, for the family. In an industry that is, uh, you know, doing as well as this and, and, you know, workers that are working as hard as they are, they can't provide health insurance uh, on the logging side of, of the business, which is insane. And, and so, you know, I, it would be easy after getting my head slapped around so many times on this issue by all these different administrations to give up on this. But it's pretty hard uh, to give up on those people that consistently see a law that is being broken, understand that there's an industry that is being taken advantage of, understand that it doesn't matter under Democrat or Republican administrations, there's too much closeness to the landowners, too much closeness to the Forest Frog Council. And, and every time that one of these things happen and you go forward and, and ask, you know, for uh, somebody to, to look into this, that, I mean, literally this summer, and I'll show you the, the slideshow, literally this summer, when I asked the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, they told me that they had talked to the landowner, the landowner said it was legal, therefore there was nothing they could do. So I, I want to show you this, this slideshow because you're going to hear after me that this is not happening. 
and uh, I can't bring the North Main Woods to you. Uh, or I can't bring you to the North Main Woods, but I certainly can show you what, uh, you know, we've started firsthand and, and uh, let somebody try and dispute that uh, that's the case. So if you just indulge me here for a moment. Excellent, Senator Jackson. Just so you know, we can't see your video. I don't know if that's something on your end or our end, but just wanted to bring that to your attention. Not, not the video you're about to show us, but the video of you speaking. I think uh, I think we need the, the ability for it to be shared. Okay. Um, you mean the video you're going to present to us? Our, our hand is raised and we need to be promoted. Yep. Yeah. Avery. Yeah. Avery. Avery, can you let him in as a co-host so he can share his screen? Um, I'm on the phone with IT right now. I don't have the option on my end to make him a panelist or a co-host right now. Not sure why. Um, and I couldn't get any answers from the Zoom support in LIO. So okay. I'm trying to get a hold of IT right now so they can okay. try and diagnose what's going on. So yeah. I just promoted him to panelist. Oh, we, yeah, we see you now, Senator Jackson. You're on the screen here. I um, don't know if that makes a difference or not. Um, We're pulling it up here, I guess. Okay, great. There we go. Looks like something's starting here. Yeah. Excellent. So, so this is a uh, Homeland Security guideline uh, for cabotage. Uh, it's not something that I made up or anything like that. This is the actual uh, Homeland Security package talking about compliance for commercial motor vehicles engaged across border, and is and I can provide this uh, to the committee. But uh, in there, as you see, movements not permitted for the driver. And this is what you'll hear today. And this is what the department has actually told me uh, when they spoke to the landowners and they spoke to uh, Forest Cross Council. Uh, they they were told that um, the owners of the trucks that uh, were doing this were actually U.S. corporations, so it was legal, uh, which is untrue. Uh, this is Canadian companies that have just filed for incorporation uh, in Maine. They're headquartered uh, in St. Paulfield and other places across into Quebec. But it, it doesn't really matter because it's not about the truck, it's about the driver. That, that's what violates cabotage. And as you can see, drivers may not pick up at a shipment at one U.S. location and deliver that shipment to another location. Drivers may not reposition an empty trailer between two points in the United States when the driver did not enter with or depart that trailer. That, that is what's happening consistently. And, and like I said, all four of those points, it's the driver, not the truck, not the owner of the truck, it's the driver just to make that very, very clear. So, so here's one of the trip tickets that, uh, you know, I, and, and this was actually pulled uh, by uh, Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, uh, one of the forest rangers uh, doing a um, uh, inspection. And as you can see, it, it, you know, they talk about this being such a hard thing to enforce and all that, but these trip tickets, are, are really, you know, the holy grail. I mean, not only are they how uh, the chain of command, uh, where the, the chain of custody, but for all of them that are um, have forest stewardship, you know, FSC, ISO, uh, SFI, these, these trip tickets uh, show where the load was picked up, where it was caught and where it was going. And as you can see in this case, the driver name is Marco. Uh, where the load was dropped off was in Portage, Portage Lake, which is in my uh, district, clearly in Maine. Uh, and you can see right underneath, well, in two places, the township, this township uh, fit five of range 13, which is in Maine, and what we refer to it as the Blue Pond Road. So the, the load was picked up on the Blue Pond Road in Maine, and it was delivered in Portage Lake in Maine. Uh, this also is, is the, the 
ticket that actually shows the weight, you know, after the driver delivers uh, to the mill, they get a, a trip ticket and, and what the weight was. So <clears throat> this is the, the, the driver and, and I could have picked a number of, of drivers, but this, this one here uh, actually has had, a, I think a three year run that uh, he's been stopped. Uh, by the forestry service and, and you know, check. Uh, what he could do and, and what is legal is to pick up a load in St. Palmfield and deliver it uh, down at, you know, uh, point B. So it would be leaving Canada, coming into Maine and dropping off. That, that is uh, allowed under uh, international law. Uh, what, what isn't allowed and what is happening is the drivers coming in uh, from St. Paulfield or from Canadian Point and picking up at A, let's say the Blue Pond Road, and delivering at B over in Portage Lake. That is That whole trip is within Maine. That's point to point in Maine, which is not legal under federal cabotage law for a Canadian driver. Nashville Plantation in Maine, right alongside Ashland and Portage Lake, uh, definitely part of Maine. It's almost 8.30 Tuesday morning. I try and document this so Forestry Service could actually pull the trip ticket for this load. He just pulled through. The Irvin Woodyard is going over to the Seven Islands Woodyard. Kind of go over and film him going on the scale there. Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator Puglia. Is it a new practice for us to have like um, okay. presentations being there made is, to Gene community? Pulling into uh, seven first Islands. I've ever seen. A video shown to committee before. Yeah. We haven't had the ability to do videos before. We have had people present charts and graphs and things like that, visual things during their uh, testimony to introduce bills. Okay. This is what it's all about right here. Right now, in times people are having a hard time, people being shut off. So what you're saying is it's now allowed for anyone that's giving testimony before our committee to be able to show us video? I I, I don't see anything that prohibits that. Certainly as like a sponsor is introducing a bill, if this is part of their testimony and introduced to the bill, I don't I don't see anything that prohibits that unless you unless you know of something in the rules that it does. I, I'm not aware of anything. To my knowledge, you know, in the eight years that I've been in the legislature, we've never had the ability for a presenter of a bill or anybody who was testifying on a bill to show any kind of props or videos or any kind of presentation other than handouts to the committee. So, uh, Senator Chipman, I certainly uh, obviously didn't ask the Senator, but the idea that we never had uh, charts or graphs or maps presented at committee. Uh, I've certainly seen that consistently throughout my time. Uh, certainly uh, this video, if uh, would not been allowed, uh, you know, maybe we need to take that up in uh, legislative council. But, but the re reality is the reason why I wanted to show it to the committee is because you're definitely gonna hear uh, real soon uh, that this is not happening uh, Northern Maine, and like I said, can't bring you uh, up there, uh, but I can show you the, what what actually is happening uh, in a very short clip, uh, so that you can, uh, you know, certainly question the people that ask why uh, or that this is not happening. I, honestly, I never once thought about the, re the reality of uh, if it was okay to show a video or not, uh, but what I did think about is all the testimony that I know is going to come that says this is not happening and making sure that the, the committee knows that um, it is actually happening. Uh, that video, I shot that on August 11th myself. Uh, then I asked Maine uh, Forestry Service to go and pull the trip tickets. 
And within a two hour period, they pulled three uh, separate uh, trucks from Canada with all H2A drivers uh, dropping off there and boarded. So uh, if I broke the rules of committee, certainly sorry, but I thought that uh, making sure the committee uh, had uh, what's actually going on um, was important. And I, I guess, I mean, I've been serving since 2010 and I, I was a co-sponsor of a bill with um, a representative from Augusta um, who presented a, a it was it was a D, it was a projector. Uh, there was a video or a presentation on a projector that was presented in a criminal justice committee. I think back in 2012, and I served on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. We had some um, things presented visually on a, on a projector to us in that committee back in 2013 or 14. I mean, it, I think it has happened. Maybe not exactly like this, like a video, uh, but things have been presented visually, certainly by sponsors of, of bills. So I, I'm not aware of anything that prohibits that if there is anything i'd like someone to bring that to my attention but i personally don't see a, a, an issue if there's nothing in the rules one way or another allowing a sponsor of a bill to present something to us visually if it adds information that's helpful to us as we consider the legislation um so i, I guess with that we can certainly talk about this more as a committee um at another time but um is there anything else you'd like to uh, continue with senator jackson with your presentation well just you know with, <clears throat> with all of your uh, conversations last week about uh, or the other week about small businesses and, and uh, PPP loans, I would have thought that making sure that main businesses uh, that are you know, getting uh, passed over for Canadian truckers uh, would have been important to this committee and showing that just would have been important. But we certainly uh, take an advisement that uh, you know, maybe this isn't the, the right way to do it, but I don't know how else you would have been able to see it other than go up there and uh, – so now you know. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So if that concludes okay. your, your testimony, is there are questions from members of the committee for Senator Jackson? Uh, Representative Kryzak, you have a question for Senator Jackson? Yeah, I do. Sure. Um, Senator Jackson, has there been any change in it since the Canadian border has been closed because of the pandemic? <clears throat> well, that's a great uh, question, Kryzak. Uh, no. Uh, Apparently, uh, Canadian truckers are considered essential, uh, so they can cross at any time. Um, you know, my district having a big part of it on the St. John River border. We've had a lot of people uh, ask me about being able to get into Canada to see their friends and relatives, uh, and they really don't understand why, um, you know, the trucks can keep rolling over uh, when they can't go over and see their, like I said, parents or whatever. So no, they, they uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> you know, in August, whenever I shot that video and uh, went with that Bangor Daily Reporter, there was a huge layoff uh, in the industry in my area of uh, truckers uh, and cutters uh, because uh, the market was bad. Uh, that video uh, actually was when a whole bunch of my constituents were at home not being able to work uh, and they kept the Canadian trucks uh, hauling throughout that entire time and we presented that at that time to the department here at Ag and that's when they uh, went back to the landowner and asked them if it was legal the landowner said yeah so so they just let it go which you know it was amazing to me that in a time whenever people were laid off, not working in a pandemic, uh, they didn't get those opportunities. If the I mean, you know, throughout this entire time, we've heard about how the reason why we need H2 workers is because of the shortage in the industry. If people are laid off because the market is bad, I can't understand for like me why we allow H2 workers to come in and take what jobs that are left. Thank uh, you. Representative, Representative Gramlich, do you have a question? Thank you, Senator. Thank you, um, Senator Jackson. Uh, so if I'm understanding this correctly, the practice that is um, occurring really puts our forest industry and hardworking Mainers in Northern Maine at a disadvantage. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, that definitely is my opinion and, and certainly a big reason I think why, you know, I've been elected there throughout this time. And, uh, you know, in 1998, uh, the exchange rate was upwards of 55% of the dollar. 
Uh, but certainly it's gone you know, up and back. Uh, I think now it's a little over 30%. But that, that's a big, that's a big um, advantage for uh, those workers. Uh, like I said, not having health insurance. Most of the people that I know in the industry don't have health insurance. If they do, they're not getting it uh, from their, their logging job. They're, they're, like I said, they're getting it hopefully from their uh, partner or their wife at another industry. So yeah, uh, but but what what's really troubling about this is when those workers and, and I want to make it very clear and I've said this consistently. I mean, you know, the men that are hauling that wood out of Canada are, are good men and good workers, and they're doing what they need to do to survive. But it's just an unfairness that I, I you know I just can't turn away from. Um, but what, what really is striking is that they leave St. Palmfield or St. Joe's, Daquam, anywhere uh, on the you know northwest border and come in and pick up a load in, in very rural and organized territory and deliver to places like Ashland, St. Paul, uh, Portage. Um, and then they subsequently pick up another load and go back. So they're hauling both ways, uh, which, you know, it's rare that American trucker uh, gets that opportunity. Uh, so that becomes a real disadvantage. Uh, they can cut the rate. They can do it for less. They're hauling both ways. They have the exchange rate. They don't have to worry about the health care. And it depresses the wages, which, again, is, a, is one of the premises of the H-2 program is you're not supposed to be able to depress the wages. But, you know, if they weren't allowed to do that, they could still come in uh, and deliver a load and, and draw up. But, but when they pick up in Maine and deliver, that, that becomes a real hardship for Maine truckers. Follow up if I may. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, little known fact, I um, actually uh, have five years working in logistics and in the trucking industry, um, having worked for FedEx Freight for a number of years. So I do have a keen understanding of what you're referring to, um, Senator Jackson. And, and you know, I just, not to make a testimonial, but I'll ask, would you agree that having a um, strong uh, industry in the forest industry and assuring that this uh, industry uh, remains strong is the backbone of a strong main economy overall? Would you agree with that? Is that a fair assessment? Well, I would say that, I mean, for all industries, I mean, uh, but, you know, certainly those heritage industries, you know, fishing, I mean, they're having a hard time with the right whale issue, uh, wind things, uh, you know, the last year this committee did, a, in my estimation, a great job uh, with the McCrum bill trying to help sale process in, in, in northern Maine, or in Maine. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, very, very problematic. Uh, you know, when, when you don't have the ability to negotiate uh, for fair rates uh, because you have uh, a whole uh, subset of, of uh, workers that can come in and undercut you, uh, in my belief, illegally, uh, you know, even, even, if, even, if you can, uh, even if you can believe that it's okay for uh, these truckers to come in and do point-to-point -point hauling in Maine, even if that is legal, the fact that they're undercutting American wages and depressing them is a violation of, of federal uh, H-2 immigration law. And, and there's no way that you can argue that they're not undercutting them. I mean, uh, they can do it for less, and, and, and they are. And, and it is uh, a long-term problem that under different administrations, people wouldn't take a stand. These departments have, a, like I said, a closeness uh, to the industry. Uh, they've already, you know, wrote their testimony and talked about uh, how this isn't happening, how it's, uh, well, it, 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 it's, it's no wonder, it's no wonder people have given up, uh, you know, with government in action. Um, and uh, I certainly understand uh, how, how people can... Um, you know, just think that there's just no nobody listening. And, and you know, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do this. It's been a long time. Uh, but but it, it, it really upsets me that something so clear 
as protecting Mainers, Republican and Democrats alike, and and we're 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 not going to do that. Uh, we talk about small businesses, but uh, for whatever reason, these ones don't seem to matter. Uh, Representative Sachs, good morning. Thank you, Senator Chipman. Good morning, President Jackson. So I. It, being new to this issue, what I'm hearing quite clearly based on your last statement, especially that this bill proposes significant state penalties in an effort to enforce a federal law. And I'm wondering if the Department of Labor responded to your complaint this past summer. The, <clears throat> we, we filed uh, a, a, a uh, complaint with the USDOL uh, I think that was our second one uh, and I have called uh, the head of the US Department of Labor Brian Pasternak numerous times uh, we can't get uh, them to um, even talk to us and I spoke with uh, Commissioner Fortman about this. And uh, I think in the last two months, they've reached out to them and they can't get them to uh, respond either. Uh, like I said, <clears throat> with the Department of Ag, uh, their, their response has been, well, it, it's legal because landowners tell us it's legal, which is just shocking to me that that's how we're gonna, we're gonna play this. But, but the, the reality is, is that I've come forward with this bill uh, twice now um, to this committee because it is happening. I mean, it's undoubtedly happening. And, and everything I see shows me that it's either illegal under cabotage or it's illegal under uh, adverse effect under the H2 program. And the only way to stop it at this point is to make some type of stand. And you're going to hear how... This is overly burdensome and such a you know huge penalty landowners. Well, landowners know what's happening. I mean, without a doubt, I've called them, I've talked to them, I've offered uh, constituents of mine to, to do the hauling. They, they know what's happening. It, it's the reason why it happens is because it saves them money. And, and that is the, the, the reason that it continues to happen. The only way that we're going to uh, get a change, if we want to change, and obviously some people may not want that, is, is to have something that actually uh, penalizes uh, the people that are allowing it to happen. And this doesn't even do it at first blush. I mean, you got a three strike provision in here before you're actually gonna get, uh, you know, the big penalty. Uh, but it, it's clearly, like I said, happening. And, and it's something that I just, like I said, uh, I'm not, I can't, I can't look people in the face when there's something black and white in federal law and, and look them in the face and tell them, well, I'm sorry, but nobody wants to take a stand on this. Nobody wants to actually enforce it. Uh, when they, we, they all know that there's no way that they can, they can work any harder, any more hours a day. Uh, I mean, I've never seen a group of people, husband and wife, you know, struggle any harder to make, things work uh, so I mean uh, I'm, I'm not I mean you know I, I think this week I've been called a one trick pony I beat the same drum all the time well I'm gonna damn well beat that drum because there's something to matter that we don't want to protect uh, the main businesses the main workers that uh, are working their ass off on a daily basis Right, and I definitely hear the frustration again my question was just around the mechanism of uh, state, significant state penalties enforcing a federal law and and sort of the, the work around that. Has our federal delegation been um, any response to you as well? That's my other uh, I've worked with uh, Congressman Golden uh, quite a bit to try and uh, uh, get the federal government to uh, do their job. And obviously, uh, you know, these past couple of months have been quite enough people for a lot of different reasons. So, I mean, it's probably not uh, taking the precedent. But, but let me, you know, just speak to that point. I mean, 
I, I, I you know, will categorically disagree with the fact that, and I'm not saying that you're saying this representative, but because this is a federal law, then the state of Maine has no role uh, in protecting Maine loggers and truckers. Uh, if, if we know that it's illegal, if we know that it's happening, if we know that there's an adverse effect and our people are, uh, you know, put in a, a situation where they, they are hard, having a harder time to compete, then I think it's incumbent on us to use uh, any mechanism that we can to enforce that federal law and make sure that uh, they have uh, the protections that they deserve. Uh, you know, federal um, inaction is not a reason for state inaction. Uh, Duly noted. Um, and just for the record, Mr. Chair, I, I would have appreciated seeing the video. I don't care what bill it's on. I don't, I, I think the additional information um, is of a benefit. So thank you so much. And um, President Jackson, if I don't know if you're able to send that to the committee afterwards, um, but that would be most appreciated. Thank you. Representative Terry, you have a question? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Jackson, for bringing this to us again. Um, I just have a question that I'm not sure if I had asked last time, but I know we're sort of in a unique position um, with our forested lands being on a border, but are there other states that struggle with uh, this particular federal law, like, um, you know, perhaps in the Pacific Northwest or even New Hampshire? Um, like I said, I know that we're definitely in a um, unique geographical location for this to be happening, but are you aware that it happens anywhere else? So, I mean, uh, I think back in uh, 08, uh, 09, um, current Governor Mills, when she was the Attorney General, uh, brought forward some of uh, our complaints. Uh, they were um, a lot similar, a group of us actually went into the North Main Woods and uh, videoed a bunch of uh, H2 workers. Uh, and that situation, what was happening was the uh, wife was uh, forming the corporation and then she was bonding the husband to come in and run their equipment here in Maine. Uh, under that scenario, uh, Governor Mills, the Attorney General's office, uh, took three companies to uh, court and found them in violation of H2 uh, law and, and uh, proof of ownership here in Maine. And, and some of those companies actually uh, left Maine and set up shop in New Hampshire. Um, Cause I remember the New Hampshire Department of Labor calling me and talking to me about it. And, and, and I asked who it was. And when they told me who, who it was, I mean, and they were the companies that we had kicked out of Maine uh, similarly. Um, since that time, those companies are back working now in Maine um, currently, and they're one of the ones that actually are violating uh, cabotage. Uh, so the only thing that I've ever heard was that one situation where um, one of these companies went to New Hampshire, and for the first time ever, New Hampshire started using H2 workers in the logging industry. Uh, I've checked, I've dealt with Washington, I've dealt with Michigan, Oregon, uh, numerous states across, and I, I've never heard of the H2 program being used in logging. But, you know, you guess you'd really have to understand, you know, the, the, the problem of uh, the North Main Woods. Uh, like you said, on the border, uh, you know, some of these places are on the Canadian side, uh, you know, are more urban centers where you have to go. 50, 60 miles uh, before you start getting to places in, in Maine. And so I think it's, it, it definitely is a problem about a site out of mind. Uh, but like, like I said, it, it, it's still, I mean, you know, the, the, the stuff that I provide you today and the other stuff I have, it all came from inspections uh, with the Department of Ag. Uh, those are not things that I was able I, to get uh, or anything like that. That was inspections that came from the department. So I mean, the department knows it's happened. They've been uh, stopping and inspecting these uh, these trucks. But again, it's to answer your question, New Hampshire did it for a very short period. 
Uh, they're not doing it right now because the company that was asking for HD workers is actually in Maine asking for HD workers. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Senator Carmichael has a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Jackson. Um, I got a couple of quick questions. One is that the uh, truck that was in the video you showed, was that one of the ones that um, has corporate, you know, has been incorporated in the state of Maine or is that? Yeah. Uh, yes. So that is actually GNA truck and, and that's um, on the trip ticket that was provided. Well, that's in that screen. Um, the video or shooting of the presentation that you know we'll get to you, uh, but uh, that driver, like you said, has been stopped um, in my well three years in a row. But I mean, I could take you to Northern Maine today, and we could stop that truck again. And basically, what that is is the company called Transport Regie uh, out of St. Paulfield, uh, and then they subsequently created GNH Tracking. Uh, which is the owners of Transport Regi. Uh, they basically just have to file and get a U.S. corporation. Uh, and in their minds, I guess in the landowner's minds at that point, uh, it makes it legal. But again, if it comes down to the driver who is clearly an H-2 worker, uh, that's that's documented here too. We can provide you, uh, you know, out of Canada. Um uh, so that, that's, that's one of them. There's numerous uh, companies that are doing that. Uh, just happened that day, like I said, I was able to video those uh, trucks and then have uh, the Rangers uh, Forest Service uh, go and pull those trip tickets. And then I had to file a freedom of information request uh, asking for the tickets. Okay. And um, I also have a transportation company. I I haul mail for the postal service and that, um, and because this mail, I have to follow interstate commerce laws. So I, I like your intent. Um, I have a problem because if I, if I break laws, then we can't hold the post office accountable for the laws I break. So I guess I understand what you're trying to do, but I have a problem with the, uh, not pun punishing the trucking companies, but punishing the the person who hired them. So, you know, that gap, I, I guess I'm having a problem with that there. So <clears throat> I understand uh, your concern there, Reverend Carmichael. I mean, I, I don't know your business model, but I would inspect that you know, you're an independent contractor, the U.S. Postal Service, and, and you have a job and you do the job you know, within a uh, defined role, but, but you decide, you know, wh what time you're leaving and things like that. The reason why I think what, what I'm trying to accomplish here is that in every step of the process, the landowner uh, dictates uh, how this operates. And, and, and they know that these drivers are uh, Canadian drivers. And so, you know, they, they can't, shed responsibility because they've created what I believe is a bogus uh, independent contractor uh, status here. I mean, they tell them, you know, there's wood on Blue Pond Road, you know, go pick it up, deliver it. It's got to be hauled to the Portage, got to be hauled to Ashland. Uh, and, and when they run out of wood there, they tell them where to go next. They know who's doing it. They know the, the you know, the drivers. And you know, foresters right there uh, making making these calls uh, to them. So while I understand the concern, uh, you know, to get at the root of the problem, uh, the landowner is going to have to uh, take the responsibility. And, and and the easiest thing would be for them just to stop uh, having these drivers uh, do these point to point hauls in Maine. Uh, and then they would never have to worry about uh, any violation, much less those the tree growth. But they consistently, uh, you know, use these these trucks. Uh, know that all the drivers are out of Canada, uh, which they could even do that. But but they can do point to point hauls and and, and uh, 
you know, put Americans uh, at a disadvantage. And, and I mean, there's just no other way to, I mean, to explain it other than that, you know, they're calling them and telling them, you know, go pick up this load in Maine and deliver it to another place in Maine. And so you get at the root of the problem, um, that's going to have to be uh, who uh, feels, uh, you know, the burden. And a follow-up, if I might. Sure, go ahead. Um, so in this circumstance, uh, the landowner would be punished, but the company that's actually breaking the law wouldn't? Is well, that <clears throat> sure. I, I think the, the where they're going to get uh, uh, punished is at that point, uh, main law enforcement through the partner of, of ACF is going to notify uh, the federal government, and these people are going to lose their ability to haul in Maine. Uh, that 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 trucking contractor is going to lose his drivers for doing a federal violation. Uh, I, I can't I can't uh, make that happen as a private citizen. I mean, it's going to take uh, somebody in law enforcement actually stepping up and doing their job, and that's that's where the penalty is going to be for those contractors. Is that uh, when, when federal government's notified, they're going to pull uh, their H two visa that allows them to, to work in this country, even on the legal halls at that point. Uh, so so that, that's the penalty for them. Is it one more, if I may. Sure, yeah. go ahead. Uh, so if we could make that happen, Senator, that would be, that would be even better if we could make what you just said happen to the contractors rather than, um, you know, trying to find a way to hold the landowners accountable, taking an, and suspending the company's authority to operate in, this, in the United States. Seems like to me that would be a, you know, it would be a far better answer to the situation. Sure. And we want more land and tea, tree growth. I mean, we want that resource there. I hate to see them penalized that way. I understand what you're saying, Representative, but I mean, the reality is, like I said, uh, you know, they've created a system where they can shed liability and say, well, it's the independent contractor. But the reality is, is that uh, they're uh, directing them at all times where to haul, where to drop off and things like that. Uh, you know, in my my world, I mean, if the HD worker wasn't allowed to do that, that would be you know, great. But I don't think it's fair <clears throat> that the landowners get a free pass on something that they have actually created. Uh, and, and, and like you said, I mean, as far as the land and tree growth, that, that's fine. I mean, I wouldn't have any problem with that. Uh, but I do think it's unfortunate whenever <clears throat> the very people that are being affected by this uh, problem are the ones that are picking up uh, the extra cost of the tree growth uh, and watching those jobs. I mean, Watching those jobs go in the foreign uh, workers uh, while they're paying the taxes is, is really hard to swallow. Uh, but I certainly understand what you're saying and I'm more than willing to look at a different scenario, but you know, don't, don't think for a minute that the large landowners don't know what's going on here. They definitely do. Thank you. So, Senator Jackson, so uh, is what you're saying the, the landowners are essentially an accomplice to the, the problem here and the problem itself is costing us jobs, costing us income tax revenue to the state, costing landowners uh, money because they're paying more, everyone's paying more property taxes to subsidize those that are in tree growth. And so the, what we're, we're looking to do with this bill is essentially um, penalize the landowners who are accomplices to the, to the problem. Well, the, the, like I said, the tree growth program I don't have a problem with it on, on the basis of what it was intended for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, as a small uh, property taxpayer, will pay more uh, with the idea that, uh, that that helps create jobs and sustain an economy. But when you watch <clears throat> Mainers you know, lose out on those opportunities, it's hard to be supportive of a program like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's why you know, I think it's, 
important that uh, the people that are creating the program, creating the the, the problem here, uh, you know, are, are at least brought into it, and they don't they don't get to shed liability and say, well, that's an independent contractor system, and and uh, you know we're we're you know we're our hands are clean. I mean, that's just not the case. I mean, I've spoken to these landowners. I mean, I fought with them. I fought with them yesterday. I fought with them on Friday. Uh, you know, I've offered to bring uh, American truckers, you know, and, and oftentimes <clears throat> under the HQ program, uh, people will say, well, Americans don't want those jobs. You know, and that's why we have to give them to, you know, other people from other countries. Well, you know, in places like Northern Maine, I mean, the logging industry is one of the few industries that there is, and, and the people that work there are incredibly hardworking. Uh, they're not uh, slackers or anything like that. But but I, you know, after consistently telling people that, you know, I can supply American, you know, owner operators uh, in areas that uh, that uh, you know Canadians are hauling. Uh, they flat out refuse uh, that, and and I know you're going to hear because this is what I've heard my entire life. Uh, these areas are so remote, Americans don't want to work there. You know, you can be at St. Pomf of my house in Allegash in, in an hour's time. Uh, you know, there, there's no with the road system that's in the North Main Woods. I mean, there's really no place that uh, is considered you know that far or that remote. I mean. You know, and, and if you're a logger and a trucker, uh, you expect that you're going to have to travel, uh, you know, significant differences, distances to, to make a living. So that's the bogus argument, too, that, um, that I expect you're going to hear. But it's just just the fact of the matter that this is this is an industry that um, has used these workers to depress the rates. And, and I don't think there's anyone that uh, when looked at can say that. Uh, that's not actually happening. Thank you, Senator Jackson. Um, and I guess uh, if there's no other questions. I just as a follow up to the, the issue around the video, I, if the Legislative Council does take it up, I would, I personally found the video very beneficial. I would encourage um, council members to allow sponsors at least to, to uh, present videos or other presentations when they introduce bills. Maybe not everybody that speaks on a bill because they're limited to three minutes, but for sponsors, I think. Where there isn't not a limit of three minutes, it would be really helpful to allow that going forward if that does come up. Um, so I guess that's, Chair, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Could I have one clarification from the senator, please? Sure. So, uh, Senator Jackson, uh, so you, your stand is that uh, because the trucking company is incorporated in the United States, the trucking part of it is legal, but because of the H two visa, the employee part of it isn't. I, my my understanding is it doesn't matter where the truck is incorporated if it's a Canadian owner if it's a U.S. owner it's the driver that that violates cabotage if it's a Canadian driver then then they they can do point to point hauling and it's the same way <clears throat> for Mainers going to Canada New Brunswick Quebec or whatever we can haul wood into Canada and we can go over there and pick up a load and, and come back. But we can't go over to Canada and pick up a load and deliver it in Canada. And, and the Canadians have no problems enforcing this. Uh, so it's basically the driver is the distinction. If it, it's a foreign driver, then you can't do uh, point to point um, you know, in, in the United States. And, and the same thing if it's a U.S. driver, you can't do point to point in Canada. But a U.S. driver could do point to point. I mean, uh, a U.S. driver could. For a Canadian company, do point to point in Maine legally? A U.S. driver could, yes. Okay, thank you. But they don't hire U.S. drivers. <laughs> oh, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none. Thank you, Senator Jackson. I look forward to working with you on the bill at the work session. Um, so we have additional testimony from those in support. Representative Martin, is he uh, with us, Avery? Checking attendee list now. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and promote him to panelist.
All right, there he is. Representative Martin, uh, welcome. Representative Martin, are you uh, ready to present your testimony? Hmm. Oh, there we are. Representative Martin, you're still on mute. No, we can't hear you, Representative Martin. There How about you. now? Yep, there you go. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let me just uh, begin by saying to Senator Shipman and Representative Terry that I am John Martin and I represent District 151. If you think of the state of Maine beginning uh, at Fort Kent uh, and then coming down all the way down through Ashland and eventually getting to Oxbow, everything west of that highway, uh, it, all the way to Canada is my legislative district. And, and obviously uh, along with uh, with the Senator, I'm fully aware of what has been going on. And it has been an issue which we have tried very hard to talk to the industry about, uh, but they seem to want to ignore it. Let me just first begin by saying that I am the sponsor and the creator of the tree growth law uh, many years ago. And I did so in the belief uh, that we ought to encourage people to, as much as possible, keep forest land in play. Uh, to grow uh, trees for the use and, and the advantage for Maine people. Uh, and, and, and let me begin by saying this. I think that maybe what we need to look at is go back and take a look at, there are conditions upon which you have to meet in order to, be, to stay in tree growth. Uh, and those conditions are listed in the law. Uh, they include basically for a grand Soul forestry plan, uh, they include a number of issues which need to be met and every so many years that plan needs to be submitted, whether it's to the municipality or uh, to the, to the re main revenue service. And maybe that we need to try to see if there's a way that we can incorporate that. The, the purpose is not to uh, put harm on the people who deserve not to be harmed. Uh, but there, when, when people tell me that the landowners don't control uh, uh, who picks up the, the, the load, uh, it's pure garbage. Uh, because obviously the landowner or the person to whom the landowner is hired to be the person who's going to cut the, and harvest the wood, uh, the, either one of them will tell them where the wood is going. And, and how it's gonna get there and who not to hire very often. They will say, we don't want that trucker. And it'll be an American trucker that they don't wanna use because maybe they wanna charge a little more than someone else might charge. So first of all, the landowners should never use that phrase with me anyway, uh, because in the bottom end of it, they have total control of who's on their land and, and where that product is going and they can dictate uh, the dic where the road is gonna go and very often who the trucker is going to be that's gonna get there. So I hope that the, the, the department uh, does not take the assumption of, uh, of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry takes the, 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 this conclusion uh, that uh, the industry is, is being alarmed uh, by, by what is trying to be done here. So I think that if the industry wanted to solve the problem, they could solve it real quickly. Uh, and I have been there. I represent uh, the community of Portage. Uh, and I've seen it not once, but whenever I end up going to camp, I see it. And I, I meet the trucks on the highway uh, and I meet them on the woods road. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden I see them and I have no problem when they come back, they come in to unload, but then all of a sudden I'll be in the yard and there they are loading uh, uh, the, the truck uh, with a foreign driver and they are frankly abusing the law. And, and if, the, if the landowners <clears throat> wanted to solve that problem, 
they could do so tomorrow morning. Uh, but they shy away because they're getting it cheaper by getting the people who might come in uh, using a Canadian truck or a Canadian driver. Uh, and, and, and that's the reason they're doing it. But I think bottom line, uh, there, this committee has an ability to deal with that issue. Tree growth was created for a purpose and it created basically not only to grow trees, but to protect jobs and, 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 put, and jobs in Maine. And, and, I'm, uh, and I, I, I've been through it and I've seen it. And, and I think that what you've seen today is a good example of, of the abuse that's taking place. I'd be more than happy to respond to any questions at today or any other time. Thank you, Representative Martin. Is there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Representative Martin, uh, for being here with us. Appreciate thank you. It. My pleasure. History on the tree growth law and your work on that over the years. Um, so we have others that would like to speak and support uh, Dana Gardner. Is Dana Gardner with us? Just promoted him to panelist. Okay, there he is. Welcome, Dana Gardner. Mm. It doesn't seem to be with us, Avery. Um, well, maybe we should go to Dave Sullivan and come back to him. Okay. So we'll now uh, hear from Dave Sullivan from Richmond. Okay, Dave Sullivan is a panelist. Great, welcome Dave Sullivan. Dave Sullivan, are you with us? Used to be some kind of technical issue here, uh, Avery. Um, I can go ahead and give them a call. Uh, I have their contact info and I can see if they're still on. Um, in the meantime, do you want to try someone else? Well, we don't have anybody else in support. So I'd like to hear from them before we move to those in opposition, but. Um, okay, sure. Let me try uh, giving them a call real we'll quick. Just, we'll take a momentary pause here and hopefully get things straightened out for both Dana Gardner and Dave Sullivan.
Hello. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is this Dave Sullivan? Yep. Uh, oh. Hold on. I'm trying to. I had to plug in another microphone here. So. Okay. See if I can get it to work here. Okay. Um, so if you can hear me, I guess I can go. Yeah. Go. Go ahead, Dave, and then uh, after you um, present, we'll hear from Dana Gardner. We'll be at, uh, at next if we can reach with uh, him. So uh, go ahead, Dave. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is David Sullivan, a uh, lifelong Mainer uh, here in Maine. I've been born and raised here, grown up here, and uh, you know, spent uh, all my summers here trying to uh, travel the state and get to know people in the state of Maine. I represent a lot of people in labor, about 6,000 members here in Maine, represent a lot of iconic industries such as logging, lobstering, shipbuilding at Bath, uh, shipbuilding down at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, so I get, I get around the state and I get to talk to a lot of people. Uh, so I was uh, calling in, in support of this bill uh, because I think this bill is mostly about accountability. Uh, Senate President Jackson has put this bill in, in my opinion, after reading it, uh, because we want accountability. And I think as Mainers, we want accountability. Um, Maine government should want this accountability in my eyes. Uh, I think the landowners, uh, they can't turn a blind eye to what's going on. They've been able to get away with it because nobody's pursued it. Um, I spent time with Maine loggers up in the woods, um, looking at these trucks coming in and uh, the, the landowners have total control of what's going on. They have the power to direct these truck drivers. Uh, a Canadian doesn't get up in the morning and come to Maine and say, well, I'm going to go go to Maine and deliver from all these points to points within the state of Maine, they're directed by somebody to do so. So um, I, I just think that it's, uh, it's hard for us as Mainers to, to, for us to turn a blind eye as well, because we know that the landowners have total control of this. And if a truck driver doesn't do what he's told, they'll find another truck driving company. So, um, you know, I, I think reading point to point legislation and, and trying to get into some of the conversations around this, you know, and I read that the Canadians are, they can only deliver goods to and from the U.S. And then when I actually take a look and read the actual language, it seems very simple, very clear to me, you know, that the actual language says that a driver may not pick up a shipment at one U.S. location and deliver that shipment to another location. So it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of gray area that the landowners can say that, you know, geez, we didn't know this was happening. So, I just think that they need to stop, you know, circumventing U.S. workers. Uh, it's important to us, I, you know, as labor, you know, we supported this governor and, you know, and we want someone to look out for, you know, the working men and women of Maine, um, you know, and, and, and this is no slight for me. It's no slight at Canada, right? Canada is a great neighbor, uh, do a lot of stuff with Canada, but family's family and Mainers are family, you know, so I think that for me, you know, just a, a regular citizen here in Maine, wanting to protect Mainers that, you know, we, we have to take a good look at this and just hold people accountable. This is about accountability. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the Maine woods talking to Maine loggers and truck drivers. You'll hear from Dana. He's a truck driver. I've talked to him, but, you know, these are people that have invested their whole, you know, life savings into their equipment you know, up in the Maine woods. I mean, there's not a lot up there. And if you haven't been, you know, traveled up there or been in that part of the state up in the alley gash, you know, you'll see that, you know, there's very few things that you can do to make a living that are, you know, good for you and your family. So, you know, we want these Mainers to be able to make a living and to have a good life and, you know, maybe to be able to go on vacation someday and, and take their kids to Disney or something, but not work, you know, 15, 16 hours every single day because they can't make a living on what they're doing. So, um, I certainly think that, you know, when people invest in equipment, um, I, I know a lot of CDL drivers. It's a very important thing here for the state of Maine uh, to keep CDL drivers in Maine. Um, you know, we use them in lobstering, logging and, and shipbuilding. We have them in all the different industries, but we have to keep work available for them. So there is no shortage of them. It's a holding a CDL is, is a great honor for these people. And they have to abide by a lot of things on their personal time, too. So. Uh, you know, they take it serious. They want to work. Uh, there's nobody out there that says they don't want to do this work. Uh, we have plenty of truck drivers that could do this work. So, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, um, pretend like it's, you know, we have this labor shortage and we can't find truck drivers. They're there. They just need to be able to make a living. Um, you know, so 
you know, I certainly hope that as lawmakers here in Maine, that, you know, we look at and take care of Maine workers and there's nothing wrong with holding uh, people accountable, whether they're landowners or the trucking companies, um, you know, they all need to be held accountable. So, you know, I, I just feel like, uh, you know, as, as labor and somebody that looks out for workers for, for, you know, my whole life and wanting people to make a living, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, main, you know, legislature, our governor, right. Our governor, you know, we were boots on the ground to get this governor elected. And we were the ones that were out going door to door saying men and women in Maine need a voice. And, you know, we thought that she was going to be that voice. So, you know, we fully expect the governor to support something like this and to make sure that these companies, these landowners, these Canadian truck drivers are all just held accountable. And that's all that, that we're looking for out of this. We're not looking to bash anybody, but just they need to be held accountable. And the, looking at the trip tickets and watching that video is a real eye opener on just how easy it is to hold them accountable, but nobody's been able to do that. So, uh, you know, I speak in support of this bill. Great. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Another questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Dana Gardner, uh, who'd like to speak in support of this bill. Dana, we, we are muted. If you could just unmute your sound. Dana, you're going to want to go to the bottom left corner of your screen. Just hover over if you don't see uh, a menu, but you should be able to see a mute button. You can have the option to mute and unmute all the way over on the left. Not yet. Yeah, you're still muted, um, Dana. Not yet. I think Avery's going to call to walk you through it. Here I think I go. just hit something that said unmute. That's okay. it. You're here. You're all Welcome. All right. Well, I can't hear you guys now, but <laughs> we, we can hear you. Um, mercy sakes. Okay. My name is Dana Gardner. Uh, I've been a trucker for 25 years and I've trucked in the North Maine woods and I've seen this cabotage going on right from the first day I ever set foot in the North Maine woods and it's becoming, um, it's becoming a real problem whenever it's taking food off your plate for your family. And, um, you're trucking up to St. Palmfield with a load that don't pay enough as it is. And you could get a load paying your truck a thousand dollars or more to come back to Portage, but you can't get that load because Canadian trucks are doing it. And these Canadian trucks are not even bringing a load into us. They're, they're coming in four or five times a day, loading American wood and bringing it wherever they want to. And uh, nobody seems to be able to do anything about that. And uh, I mean, I've got friends that would gladly come on this Zoom and tell you guys all about what's going on. But if they dare would say something, the landowner would blackball them and they'd be out of a job. And that's exactly what happened to me. 
Um, unfortunately, I've had some medical issues in the last couple of years that's preventing me from probably ever going back to drive a truck again. But um, friends of mine, relatives, brother-in-law, uncles, uh, they've all been trying to um, get help with this issue. And the forest rangers, they don't care. Customs officers, well, it's, it's not up to them. Uh, border patrol, not up. No, yep, talk to somebody. I don't know. I don't know. It's sad and um, that it's a federal law and it can't be enforced. Like, I don't get it. Like, what's going on? Um, but I mean, I was with Troy this summer and we took videos of the supposedly Reggie Transport um, created a GH trucking American company. So now it's an American truck. Well, their office is in St. Palmfield on the main side in a building that the grass is growing up around it. There's cobwebs. There's nobody in the door. There's no electricity in the place, but it's, there's a sign on the, on the porch says uh, main office for G and H and there's a Canadian phone number to call. So it's pretty black and white, you know, um, really sad that uh, we're losing out, you know, upwards to four and five thousand dollars a week gross revenue because we have to drive our trucks a hundred miles back down a portage empty when we're following in the Canadians' dust and they're getting uh, they're getting it done and getting paid good money. Not at a cut rate, they're getting paid good money to do it. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you, Dana. Is there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you for being with us today. Appreciate it. Um, so we now have uh, heard from those that have signed up to speak in support. So we'll now um, switch over to those that would like to speak in opposition to LD-188. Um, and Avery, just so you know, we'll start with the those at the top of the list and work our way down. I think just to save some time um, as we uh, promote people we'll announce the, the first person and then say that the next person on deck and then maybe you can promote them so they're ready to go um, right after the, the, the previous person. So we'll start with Anthony Horahan, um, followed by Ben Carlissi. Okay, just promoted Anthony. Hey, good morning. Welcome, Anthony. Good morning, Senator Chipman, Representative Perry, and members of the committee. I represent Irving, timberland owner, mostly in Aroostook County. Uh, we've uh, been timber owners in the county since 1946. We supply about uh, a little over a dozen mills in the state of Maine, including two of our own, one in Dixfield and one uh, in the Ashland area from from those lands. And I'm here today to testify in opposition to LD-188. This is a bill that is presented to be a solution, but we don't believe that the, the problem lies with landowners. It, it seems that uh, many folks think this is a legal issue that uh, uh, people that are, are using bonded labor have the right under the law to do so. So we think it's it's a bit of overkill. As Senator, or sorry, uh, Representative Martin uh, spoke the tree growth tax program was put in place in 1969 to promote landowners with more than 10 acres of forest land uh, to keep these lands as working forests. The idea was to prevent good stewardship of the forests, benefit uh, long-term means uh, forest industry, as well as to provide all the other benefits that society gets from healthy forests. The idea of removing a landowner from tree growth for using a legal contractor was using a legal employee has nothing to do with good forest stewardship. The basis of qualifying for tree growth is based on having a managed plan and undertaking forest management, not managing an independent contractor's employees or a subcontractor's employees. Uh, also, uh, one of the issues we see with the bill is that tree growth today is the same for everybody from 10 acres uh, to a million acres. And this would put a different categories in place where 
someone with 50,000 acres or over would be treated to someone uh, differently than someone with less than 50,000 acres. If this is a, a big issue that needs to be dealt with, uh, what's the difference in someone with 35,000 acres or 10,000 acres or 1,000 acres uh, utilizing this if, if it's not a legal uh, way to do business? The bond of labor that is undertaking the work is doing so legally under state and federal laws is my understanding at this point. And Senator Jackson was pointed out that he's gone to many different departments and they've initiated investigations and there was no violations revealed. So no violations, which tells me as, as a landowner that uh, folks are working within the boundaries of the law. And in fact, that's ingrained in our contracts that they must follow all state and federal laws in, in our contracts. So again, it's a solution that's looking for a problem that I don't believe is tied to the landowner. And it's, if there is an issue with the, the bonding, uh, which is quite an intense purpose or a process, sorry, to get a bond demonstrating that you can't find local labor, uh, then that's where the uh, the issue should be should be looked at, but not on a on a tree growth tax uh, that's there to promote good forest stewardship in the long term. So again, I'd uh, I'd urge you to pass ought not to pass on LD one eighty eight. I thank you for your time today. Great, thank you, Mr. Horan. Is there questions from members of the committee? Uh, yes, Rep. Uh, Representative Batlock. Thank you, Senator Chipman. Um, and welcome, Mr. Horahan. I have a question about H-2A visas. I understand that's how um, the drivers are allowed to come into the country and go port to port. Um, who sponsors those H-2A visa um, applications? Does your company- I'm, I'm not aware, we, we don't. Uh, no, we, we don't currently have any uh, H-2A visas. I, I think the last time we did was probably 15 years ago or so. Uh, so it would be sponsored directly from the contractor, I would believe, but uh, we're not directly involved in that. We okay, tend to because I, I was we work just uh, quite closely with H2B on the civic cultural workers. I'm sorry, say again, You H2B is the visas that your workers use? Generally, that's the ones we use for our civic culture programs in the summer, our tree planters and, and folks like that. But, uh, our workforce is, is comprised of local mayors from the county. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Any additional questions to members of the committee? Go ahead. I have one quick one, Mr. Speaker. Sure. Um, is, does your company, um, do they harvest the wood and truck the wood as a landowner? Do you have all phases of this? Or are you with? No, uh, we've. Uh, no, so we're, uh, we're, we're a bit of a combination compared to some other landowners that the majority of our work is done with independent third party contractors, uh, trucking and harvesting included, as well as road building. Uh, we do have one small fleet of trucks that we run as company employees. Uh, so we do have that. That's a little bit of a, we call it the farm team where we have folks that come on and we can, we can teach people the correct way to drive and, and, uh, and that type of thing, but generally I would say 95% plus or 98% of what is done is independent third party contractors. And and the people that you have uh, doing them jobs, them are currently Maine citizens or? or... Yes, yes they are, yeah. We've, we've made a big uh, effort in the, really since about 2004 to uh, with training and trying to assist people through financing and other ways to get into the business. And, and uh, as, as Dana pointed out a few minutes ago, uh, having someone drive a miles uh, the wrong way every morning or something. Uh, so we're trying to find folks from the St. John Valley or the Oakfield Holton area uh, to work on, on our operations as contractors or employees. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Horahan. Um, we'll now hear from Ben Carl Lissel, followed by Christopher Fife. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, it's Ben Carlisle, by the way. Uh, distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation, my name is Ben Carlisle. I'm president of Prentice and Carlisle, headquartered in Bangor. 
We are a large uh, forest manager and a forestry services provider. We represent forest landowners, large and small in Maine and beyond. And we ourselves have owned Timberland since our company's founding in 1924. And I'm here today to express my strong opposition to LD-188. As a landowner and land manager, we contract with many independent full service logging companies to harvest and deliver our timber to various mills throughout the state. These third party service providers are professional. They're excellent at what they do. They produce high quality work and they're diligent about following the regulations they are, I operate under. Some of these service providers in turn subcontract with other vendors for part of this work, including for the transportation of these forest products. All of our contracts are conditioned on, among other things, these vendors following all applicable federal, state, and local laws. However, we can't police their daily activities or absolutely ensure that everything they do, both on and off our property, is legal. For example, deep in the woods, it's impossible to police who happens to be trucking the forest products on a given day, the routes they happen to use, the registration status of each of their trucks, the driver's immigration status, and instead we rely on the contractor's professionalism, much as any homeowner would do when they hire someone for work on their house. To punish a landowner for illegal activities of their contractors, as well as any subcontractors that are then hired by that contractor is inappropriate and dangerous. It's akin to doubling a homeowner's taxes when a plumber is caught with an expired driver's license on the way home from the job. And much like the homeowner, landowners expect and demand through contracts that the people they hire follow the laws. And when they don't, we don't hire them. Canadian truckers can always refuse a point to point delivery if it would violate the law. We also object to this proposed legislation's perverse use of Maine's successful tree growth tax law as a punishment. When landowners are removed from tree growth, there's a significant tax penalty for withdrawal. And this penalty is an incentive to keep landowners in the program to keep practicing good forest management for the long term and not as a punitive mechanism when certain landowners are forcibly withdrawn from a program for totally unrelated violations of the law by third parties. LD-188 proposes that a substantial penalty and a massive tax increase be imposed on landowners and I believe that will discourage keeping working for us working. And this is all for something they had no ability to enforce or control. The practice of point to point delivery by those who aren't federally permitted to do so is illegal and it should be enforced. However, I don't believe LD 188 is the solution. It's inappropriately tied to tree growth and it imposes a, an astonishing punishment on landowners who have made no violations. And therefore I urge you to vote ought not to pass on LD 188. Great, thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Is there any questions for members of, from members of the community? Uh, go ahead, Representative Matlock. Thank you, Senator, and uh, welcome, Mr. Carlisle. Uh, Mr. Carlisle, does your company sponsor H-2A visas? We do not. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Grantwood. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Um, so uh, I'm just kind of curious, I appreciate appreciate your perspective in terms of not being able to kind of have that kind of control in the northern Maine woods of who's doing what that you're not actually observing. But if you were aware of some sort of um, illegal activity, how would you address that? Yeah, we uh, there's certain in terms of the point to point that. Um, sure. Uh, well, uh, we aren't aware of, of uh, uh, if we were to discover that, I mean, they would, the contractor would no longer work for us. We, there have been cases where we had to enforce laws where drivers have continually operated overweight, for example. Um, and in those cases, when we find violations of the law, we no longer hire those people. So we have the ability to, to, uh, to cancel the contract and to uh, prevent them from, from, uh, from being hired by us. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Yes, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Representative Carmichael. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Kyle, when you when you uh, contract a private contracted, um, it, do you have in writing um, any recourse for breaking the laws? Do you make it explicit in your contract with them? We do. Uh, we have a statement in each of our vendor contracts that. Uh, where they are uh, directed to follow all state, local, and federal laws. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Thank you. From Christopher Fife, followed by Don Tardy. 
Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and distinguished members of the tax committee. Uh, Warehouser opposes LD-188. As we see, this bill seeks to use the main tree growth tax law, tree growth, to penalize a subset of forest landowners in the state for actions taken by another independent business. And I should, I want to mention that none of our land is actually in Aroostook County. Uh, we've really been drawn into this because of the arbitrary uh, identification of 50,000 acres as a threshold for uh, the size of landowner that would be uh, potentially penalized uh, for this, uh, with this new bill. Uh, Warehouser owns and sustainably manages over 840,000 acres of timberland in Maine. And our forest land is enrolled into the tree growth program. The trees that we grow and harvest make a significant contribution to Maine's forest economy each year. The forest products industry creates approximately 15,000 direct jobs in Maine, and each of these workers play an important role in the forest products supply chain. Forest landowners, logging and hauling contractors, and forest products manufacturers rely on each other. Tree growth provides a stable, consistent base for the industry, allowing landowners to maintain forest and make long-term investment in growing trees. This in turn supports outdoor recreation, clean air and water, and healthy wildlife habitat. LD-188 proposes to deal with trucking violations by removing a landowner from tree growth if an independent trucking contractor breaks a federal law or regulation or an international trade agreement. This penalty could be in nearly a million dollars. We hire independent contractors to harvest and haul our timber. Those contractors often hire independent truckers to haul the wood to the mills. Our contacts with these independent businesses require that all state and federal laws must be followed. We support full enforcement of all laws, including those regarding transportation of forest products by both state and federal agencies. But we rely on enforcement of laws to make these contracts meaningful. The equitable taxation provided through tree growth is an essential factor keeping Maine's working forest as forest. As you've heard, eligibility for tree growth must continue to be determined by current use of the land and sound forest management and shouldn't be tied to and allowed to become a tool of unrelated policy or issues. And finally, all wood harvested in Maine for commercial purposes is transported by truck regardless of the size of the ownership. LD-188, as I mentioned, arbitrarily singles out forest landowners with more than 50,000 acres. The fact is that harvested forest products transported within Maine in violation, quote, in violation of federal law or regulation or an international trade agreement could as likely originate from a 20 or 100 acre ownership as one over 50,000 acres. So Warehouser respectfully urges you to maintain the integrity of the tree growth program by voting ought not to pass on LD-188. I thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Mr. Fife. Any questions from members of the committee? Representative Matlock. Thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Fife, I'll ask you the same question I've asked the others. Do you sponsor H2A visas? We do not. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Fife. Appreciate your testimony. You. We'll now hear from Don Tardy, followed by Donald Mancius. Is Don Tardy uh, ready to present testimony in opposition? It appears he's not ready or not with us for some reason. Is Donald Mancius uh, able to uh, come on and present a testimony in opposition? Can you hear me now? This is Don Tardy. Yep, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute on my screen. Um, Honorable Senator Ben Chipman, Honorable Representative Maureen Terry, and distinguished members of the Committee on Taxation. My name is Don Tardy and I reside in Ashland. Today I'm offering testimony in opposition to LD-188. I've worked in the forest products industry since 1972. I've been a registered professional forester for all my forestry career. And I've held various forest management positions from manager of logging operations to woodlands, to lumber mills, fiber procurement for a major pulp and paper company. And I currently serve as president of the Ashland Area Economic Development Corporation. 
And this is the primary reason I'm here today. Because late in 2019, Aspen lost its major employer and biggest contributor to the municipal tax base. ReEnergy's biomass electric generator contributed over $453,000 in annual municipal revenues representing about seven mills to the Ashland base. Prior to losing ReEnergy, Ashland's mill rate was 27. In 2020, Ashland was able to bridge the seven mill impact by exhausting its rainy day fund. The board of selectmen are desperately trying to find solutions to bridge the gap for 2021 with little success. The only real solution for our community is to encourage investors to come to Ashland. Our economic development Co corporation is hard at work to obtain industrial property and market our community for the great forest resources we have around us. My primary concern with LD 188, if enacted, is that it has the potential to upset our whole ownership structure of the North Main Woods. Our forest landowners, loggers, and wood processing mills are the backbone of the Route 11 corridor in Arusta County. Any upset situation resulting in changes to these, our three-legged economic stool will have a dire impact on our region. The resulting impact will also weigh heavily on our ability to attract investors to our region as the sustainability of fiber supply will be seriously questioned. My second concern with LD188 is since the inception of tree growth tax law in 1969, it has been the favorite punching bag for many who have an ax to grind with the forest products industry. Tree growth is the most progressive forest taxation law in the country. Many states I've had the good fortune to work in envy Maine's tree growth tax law. We can attribute Maine's current forest inventory and solid base of private landowners, small and large, to tree growth. It has served our state extremely well for over 50 years, so why do we have to change it now? My final concern is that bonded and visa labor has been within the fabric of Maine's woods labor force since I can remember. Today, the numbers diminish to a handful from the great numbers that were needed to salvage the timber resulting from bedwater infestation in the 60s and 70s. Through the history of the Canadian Labor Program, there has been complaints on a number of occasions without significant findings. If there are significant abuses, let's have the federal government investigate our own program or its own program so we can deal with facts rather than anecdotal comments. Why should we arrest, risk the whole economic infrastructure of our force without facts? Our own State Department of Labor has conducted its, their own investigation without findings. Are we destined to continue chasing ghosts on the program or should we get the facts and act accordingly? I respectfully ask you to support our force industry and vote ought not to pass on LD-188. Great, thank you, Mr. Tardy. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us uh, today. We'll now hear from Donald Mancius, followed by Hannah Stevens. And for those that are um, presenting testimony today, please um, know that you'll need to start your video if you're going to present to us um, with video and also unmute yourself for the <coughs> audio. Um, is uh, Donald Mancius with us? Uh, Senator, I am uh, speaking neither for nor against today, so oh, I, I can wait my turn. Yeah, okay. Well, we had you down as speaking and against. I'm not sure why that is, but we'll we'll uh, come back to you when we get to neither for nor against. Appreciate you. Thank, letting thank you, sir. Uh, so is Hannah Stevens with us to speak in opposition to this bill? Yes, I am. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, let me just get my screen here. Uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and distinguished members of the Taxation Committee, I am Hannah Stevens, a resident of Glenburn and land use director of Seven Islands Land Company. I'm speaking in opposition to LD 188. Seven Islands Land Company manages approximately 820,000 acres of family owned commercial timberland in Maine, the majority of which is enrolled in tree growth. And I wanna point out that in 1973, parcels of timberland over 500 acres in size were automatically enrolled in the program per law whose purpose is to serve the public interest by encourage forest landowners to retain and improve their holdings of forest land and to promote better forest management by appropriate tax measures in order to protect the unique, and econ unique economic and recreational resource. 
It's been successful in achieving this goal and is still an important component of forest conservation in the state. It's arguably one of the most successful in the country and will be increasingly important in the future as the state and nation look to forests as a natural climate change solution. According to the bill's proposed language, in the event of a violation of federal transportation laws by companies or individuals that transport forest products, this bill seeks to penalize large landowners with a mandatory withdrawal from the tree growth tax program. Um, most companies that do the work of transporting forest products are independent contractors and not employees of the landowner or land manager. As such, the only source of influence or recourse the landowner or land manager has is through our contracts with the independent contractors. And like others, our contracts are explicit in the requirement that federal and state laws must be followed, including those dealing with bonded labor, such as those under the H-2A worker program. Um, under this program, it is legal for a Canadian driver to pick up a load of logs in Maine and deliver it elsewhere in Maine. Hence, why would drivers um, endeavor to undergo the rigorous process to obtain H-2A visas rather than operate as a B-1 driver where point-to-point -point deliveries in the U.S. are prohibited. Um, the financial penalties incurred by landowners in a mandatory withdrawal from the program as, in, as is contemplated by this bill would constitute a consequence far in excess of the violation. Further, such egregious use of the tax policy to enforce a labor-related matter represents a very poor precedent and a jeopardization of the stability and benefit of this program um, that this program has provided to the state. There are already existing procedures in place to deal with violations of federal or state labor laws, making this bill unnecessary at best, and at worst, a short-sighted, harmful, and unprotective attempt to once again link the tree growth tax law to an unrelated and non-existent issue. Therefore, I urge you to vote ought not to pass on LD-188. Thank you for your consideration. Great, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Are there questions from members of the committee? Representative Matlock. Thank you, Senator. Mm -hmm. Ms. Stevens, I note that you do have folks, you do sponsor H-2A visas with your company? We do not. Um, we contract uh, with a contractor who does have H-2A drivers under their employment. Um, what we do is provide a letter to the uh, contractor that this is what, how much we'll be hauling so that they can petition to get those workers. So it's a, it's a contractor to provide visas or is it a, is it a, it's a, it's a trucking it's a company? Truck, it's a trucking company, correct. And, and they have to go through the process of, um, you know, proving that there aren't all the re requirements of the H-2A program, proving that they cannot find American workers, et cetera, um, in order to hire H-2A drivers. Okay. Um, so this is a trucking company and the trucking company doesn't own any, any forest lands or anything like that. Correct. Correct. We're not a trucking company. We're a land management company. We yeah. manage for the landowner. Ah, thank you very much. Great. Uh, any additional questions from members of the committee? Um, seeing none, we will now, uh, thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Stevens, appreciate it. Um, we'll now hear from John Cashwell, followed by Patrick Stotch. Mr. Cashwell, are you ready to present testimony in opposition? I'm working the, the mute button here. Um, I'm John Cashwell. I'm the uh, a representative of BBC, BBC Land LLC, which is a, a management company uh, that manages a million acres from uh, Machias River to the New Hampshire border. Uh, I'm not involved in the North Maine woods. Um, at this time, I, though I used to be in two different uh, positions, one as the director of the Maine Forest Service, uh, which oversees timberland all over the state, and the other was as president of Seven Islands uh, that I ended work with in 2008, I believe. Uh, while I don't have the total details of uh, the senator's video and that sort of thing, I do want to object to this law because of the tree growth tax, 
uh, being used inappropriately and heavy handedly uh, <coughs> to enforce uh, state and or federal laws related to transportation H2A and whatnot. It, it's, it's sort of, <laughs> it's a funny thing. Uh, I live in Bangor, Maine. Um, you have a grocery store nearby that, that uh, receives all kinds of goods and services via truck drivers. And it would be like, oh, uh, you being responsible for the driving behavior of, of the beer truck that comes every other day and delivers stuff to your uh, store. And if they have three violations, then uh, it would be like uh, uh, taking the liquor license away from that store and raising their taxes in arrears for about three years. It doesn't match up with the uh, legal and structural system that we have uh, in this state. I would urge you to um, not to pass this bill um, because it's, a, I believe, an inappropriate use of uh, tree growth tax to enforce uh, laws, ancillary laws in the product, in the business of moving, producing, and delivering forest products. It, it doesn't match up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cashwell. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being here with us today. We'll now hear from Patrick Stott, followed by Peter Prandafilo. Is uh, John, uh, I'm sorry, is Patrick Stotch with us? Yes, yes, um, I think you can hear me. Yes, Senator Patrick. Chipman and uh, Representative Terry and distinguished members of the committee. Um, my name is Patrick Strzok. I'm the executive director of the Maine Forest Product Council. We try to make sense out of uh, uh, all the different membership that we represent. We have loggers and truckers, as well as uh, uh, pulp mills and paper mills and sawmills, and um, over eight and a half million acres of dues paying landowner members as well. So I work hard to try and arrive at, um, at the many issues we get confronted with. We have generally been working on rebuilding our economy and recovering from the pandemic and uh, making great progress that way. But this issue is, a, is a, a passionate issue by the Senator. He and I have been at, at uh, our positions for the similar amount of time. Um, this is actually a generational issue talking about Canadian labor in the Maine woods. And um, so we've been dealing with this for some time. Um, this bill we're against, uh, it has uh, a lot of things that are disproportionate in terms of uh, structure and uh, concern. It penalizes folks in the tree growth tax program. I think you've heard from the landowner community who incidentally is, is not the villain here. They've been uh, working hard with their contractors through this pandemic to keep everybody whole and to try and find a way to, uh, to uh, work up in this uh, North Maine Woods region that we seem to be talking about. Um, landowners haven't talked about this much, but they have kept operations going. They've had temporary shutdowns, but it's remarkable that they've been able to uh, work in the region. And I think all of those involved are appreciative of that. Um, the tree growth penalty, you've heard a number of reasons why we're against that. Um, it's not connected directly to the issue, uh, it discriminates and against an entire class of landowners. When you start separating tax policy into size classes of landowners, you begin to uh, violate some principles of taxation. Um, and um, you need to understand there's a penalty when you get out of the tree growth tax law. Um, and that's a significant penalty. It's designed that way. Uh, never mind the new tax rate you're taxed at. So these are not little numbers. They're disproportionate. They're outsized with, uh, with uh, any kind of penalty we're aware of for uh, federal violations of cabotage laws. But let's, we can work on, we can talk about that some more, but that's why this is such a huge disruption in the workforce. Uh, cabotage law, I, I can help you, uh, not in three minutes, but 
We can talk about uh, the visa categories that are involved in this. Uh, the, the B1 visa is what is the Canadian um, coming across on a daily basis and hauling into Maine. And those are the folks that are under the cabotage laws. The H2A visas that we've been talking about, um, they are, it's a program managed by the state of Maine uh, for the federal government. So you have state officials watching over that program. And at this point, you might think there are thousands of uh, truckers coming in under this program. Right now, there are 12. We're talking about 12 truckers who, in combination with U.S. truckers and contractors, are hauling materials uh, within the state of Maine. They go through a rigorous process and just like you can apply for these H-2A workers to be truckers, you can apply for them to be loggers and mechanics. Um, there's also programs associated with the H-2A and H-2B that bring in restaurant workers. So it's a similar kind of way we have to make sure, and there's a vigorous program to bond these agents to make sure they're not disrupting a U.S. job, and actually they can get bumped by a U.S. worker within six months of their initial appointment. So it's a pretty rigorous appointment uh, process. These are not cheap ways to go in terms of bringing people in. You need to be, uh, contractors need to be really think, working uh, thoroughly to try and uh, uh, bring these folks in. So I just wanted to provide that kind of perspective. Um, You've heard about landowner control. Uh, I think you, you understand uh, they're not hiding from anything. They're more, they run top-notch businesses. They, uh, they want all their contractors to obey the law. This is not a, a loophole situation. This is um, something that everybody is working uh, under the law. We've worked with the congressional delegation to understand these concerns. We work closely with the main DOL. There is actually an investigation last year, a uh, complaint raised. Um, the Rangers were out taking a look at the complaint um, and they came back with uh, no violations based on the dual citizenship of those that were involved. So there's a lot more to this. I understand it's a passionate issue for uh, the, the senator from uh, Rustic, but um, there's a lot more to be discussed and some perspective to be shed on this issue. Um, and I think there's plenty of questions you can ask of uh, a number of people that are involved in it. So I thank you for your time and uh, be glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Strach. Is there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being here with us today. Thank I'm you. here from Peter Tran de Flow, followed by Tom Doak. Is Peter with us? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, great. Uh, great job of my name, by the way. Peter T to most folks. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, distinguished members of the Taxation Committee, my name is Peter Tran de Flow. I live in Orono and I represent H Huber Resources Corp. It's a family owned timber management firm that manages approximately 600,000 acres here in Maine from Northern Maine to down East Maine. I'm gonna be respectful of your time um, because we are running kind of late. And uh, I'll start by saying I concur with what the previous opponents have said. And I will concentrate on three particular points that I'd like you to think about and then hopefully come in under three minutes. Um, as you've heard, tree growth is a very long-term commitment. It's probably, it's arguably the most successful and cost-effective conservation program in the state of Maine has prevented thousands of acres from being developed. Um, but as you've heard, there are penalties for being withdrawn. Now, nobody's ever pulled out 50,000 or 100,000 acres out of tree growth. So I have no idea how the penalty would be calculated, but they're assessed on a per acre basis. And they're, and they're based on the difference in valuation between the value of growing trees for tree growth or ad valorem. And even if the difference were only a couple of dollars per acre, for a 50,000 acre landowner, you're talking about $100,000. For 100,000, you know, you're, you're, you're in six figures before you know what's happening. And generally speaking, the valuation difference between tree growth and ad valorem is quite, quite a bit more than just a couple of dollars per acre. So the penalties are just 
way outsized of anything that would relate to transportation law from what I can see. I just can't see a reasonable person considering it, considering it equitable. Um, I, I want to, to uh, reiterate the point that um, the, log, we, the loggers and truckers that work on Huber's, on the land that Huber manages are professional independent contractors. They're not our employees. Uh, Folks have said that the landowners direct everything and they're in control of all of this trucking. We do in fact have contracts to deliver wood to mills, say Irving's mill in, in uh, Portage or uh, the mill in Masardis and Ashland. And so we, we ask our contractors to deliver wood to those locations. However, we don't get into the employment of our contractors. That's their business. We don't control who their drivers are and where their drivers are coming from. We just ask them to harvest wood in a certain manner based on a management plan and deliver it to certain mills based on the contracts that we have. So the idea that we're somehow in the uh, pockets of all of these contractors and directing them in every aspect of their business is just not true. We just ask them to do a certain service and how they run their business is up to them. As with previous uh, speakers, all of our contracts have clauses that require contractors to, to uh, meet all, all applicable laws and regulations. Our remedy, if they don't, if there are violations, is to terminate a contract and not contract with them again. However, that's an after the fact event. We have to see evidence of a violation and then we can terminate the contract. And under this law, we would already potentially be on the hook for these outsized fines. Um, and um, I, I wanna point out again too, that this is, this, this is a federal issue about its um, uh, uh, international transportation and international drivers. I believe it's regulated under USMCA, the successor to NAFTA. And uh, as previous people have mentioned, it's been, it's been uh, audited before and violations haven't been found. So I just don't see where there's, um, I, I don't see the problem and I certainly don't see the need for uh, potentially threatening landowners with such huge fines. Um, and the very last thing I wanna say is, is that, and somebody already said it, is there is a class of of foreign labor, like the, H, the H2As, I believe, where it's legal for them to go point to point. So some people don't believe that that's true, but in fact, that's the reason why no violations have been found. And as Patrick said before me, those people that run those trucks, there's about 12 of them in the state of Maine. Um, that's it, I would urge you to vote against this. Uh, I'm opposed to it and I would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from members of the committee? Um, so if you were aware of a violation, what would you do about it? If um, I mean, we try to be fair. If, if a contractor violates something like they have overweight trucks, we'll, we'll point it out to them and say, you've got to stop doing that. If they have a, uh, um, if they continue to do so, then we would just terminate the contract. We stop doing business with them. We have every right to terminate a contract, regardless of how far along we are in, in a job, uh, if the contractor is not obeying the laws of the state of Maine or the federal government. So that, that's our, our sole remedy is to cease doing business with them. Right, I understand that, but if you're getting a substantial tax break under tree vote from the state of Maine, do you think there's some obligation to report violations to the proper authorities if you're aware of them? Uh, we depend on the authorities to, to, um, to tell us of violations. We're not, we're not an enforcement agency. I, you know, we could be opening ourselves, I would think we could be opening ourselves up to some, to legal consequences if we accuse contractors of breaking the law. So if, if, if they broke cabotage laws and we were informed that the Department of Labor or the federal government was fining them for violating laws, then we, we would exercise our right to terminate the contract. No, I understand that. But if you were aware of violations that were going on and nothing was done by state or federal authorities, about it because maybe they didn't know there's no investigation but you were aware of it um in addition to terminating the contract didn't you, don't you feel like you have some kind of obligation to report those violations since you are getting a, a, a substantial tax break from the state of maine to being in tree broke uh do you have some obligation on the on your part to report any violations like that in addition to now, that, that, that's a good question senator chipman I, I don't i really can't answer it the only time we've exercised that clause was for overweight trucks truckers some truckers have difficulty staying within that rule and if, if we see more than a few, we'll tell, we, you know, we give them warning and that's, that's a fairly clear thing. It's weight. It's pretty obvious whether they're in obeying or not versus labor laws and cabotage, which most of us don't understand. So the only one we've ever done is overweight trucks. And we didn't turn them in to the police because by that time, it's only our record and the trucks are gone. We just stopped doing business with them. Uh, we have questions from Representative Matt, like I believe was first followed by Representative Sachs. Thank you. Um... I'm concerned. You you don't know enough about cabotage to worry about it. 
I expect the contractors that we hire to obey all the laws. They're the experts because they're using the program. That's not my field of expertise. We manage timberlands. Okay. Um, with your with the contracts with your truckers, do you specifically point out cabotage because that has been something that's been of concern recently. Um, so it, it, they just provide trucks and you um, you don't make any requirements that they be allowed to go between um, uh, facilities within the state of Maine. Our, our contracts our contracts specify that they have to obey all laws and regulations. We don't we don't uh, itemize them out. They have to obey uh, all laws and regulations. Okay, thank you. Representative Sachs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. T, I would um, ask a sort of complimentary question to my that my colleague did. We've just heard repeatedly that landowners are stating that we require in our contracts to that they follow all state and federal laws. However, you don't in, have any enforcement whatsoever that you just stated. You would only find that out through a Department of Labor, Federal Department of Labor. You don't check trip tickets or anything like that that we were brought evidence of? Um, we, we see them all. And if something looks fishy, we'll, we'll go after it. We just never have had that situation. Um, I, let me put myself in the position of, of, of a contractor that's doing work with, with my company. If, if my company, if, if I'm accused of breaking the law, I say, well, prove it. You know, I mean, you're not the police and you're not the law enforcement agency. So well, that you know, was my have... question regarding your trip tickets. So I'm assuming you issue trip tickets that, that your contractor and do you review them? Of course we do. Yes. Yeah. And so so like that said, would be something... the proof. That would be the evidence. And you're saying you've never seen evidence of that. But yeah, if you did, you wouldn't wait for a Department of Labor that you would go ahead and enforce that. I, I am not sure how we would handle that, quite frankly. It's just never happened. And, and we're very careful about not being enforcing agents. We can terminate a contract, we can stop doing business with somebody, but we're not enforcing agents. Hmm. I guess I, I would have some concerns only because we've heard that repeatedly that you should not penalize us because we have this clause within our contract that states you must follow them. However, we do nothing to your point, to actually determine that. You're just resting. And then you just said, well, then have them prove it. You have the means to do that through these trip tickets. The trip ticket doesn't say whether a particular driver is an H2A or a B1. I've, I have no way of knowing that from the trip ticket. The, the, the main forest service, if they're auditing, can go further. But I just have the trip ticket. It shows where the wood came from, where it went, who the trucker was, but whether that trucker has got the appropriate, the the contractor is the one to make sure that they have the appropriate and, and the legal trip tickets that we have don't list that information. Not that I've ever seen. Hmm. Thank you for your answers. Any I'm going to do my best. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us. Thank you um, for having me. We'll now hear from uh, Tom Doak in opposition and then we will move to testimony from those neither for nor against, um, starting with Donald. Uh, Manciest. So we'll now hear from Tom Bill. Great. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, Chair Chipman, Chair Terry, members of the committee, my name is Tom Doak. I'm the executive director of the Maine uh, Woodland Owners. We're the organization that represents the smaller woodland owners in the state, generally those own 10 acres up to maybe a few thousand acres. Um, the, the tree growth tax, and it's speaking in opposition, the, the tree growth tax law is really the most important um, tax law for our family woodland owners in Maine. It is the reason that so many landowners are able to keep their land as, as forested land. The purpose of the program is to keep land uh, and tax land as forest land instead of its development value. There are about 10,000 smaller owners in the program. Um, as, a, as, as it was mentioned, uh, initially everybody over 500 acres was put into the program, whether you wanted to be or not, you were put in. Most of the time a landowner, uh, as, as it's currently written, um, obviously most of our, uh, the people that we work with um, would be exempt, the 50,000 acre limit. Um, but the, the biggest fear that a woodland owner and that we represent uh, has about being in the Trico tax law program is a change that occurs that they are, that, that after they've enrolled. And 
to, to understand that it is, uh, you know the rules when you get in, those, those are understood. But the legislature can change the rules anytime it wants. And you are, you, there is no, unlike most tax programs, there's no out for free. Under the main constitution, you must pay a penalty if, if your land comes out for regardless of what reason. So landowners are very nervous about those changes that occur. So you have a situation here in this bill where you're bringing something into the trickle tax law program that is completely unrelated. There's not, transportation is not talked about in the law at all. And um, so you're bringing something in and then you're, and then as we interpret it, you're holding not the land, you're holding a landowner or penalizing a landowner for the violation of some, by someone who's doing something else on their land, not, not their violation, but the actions of somebody else. Those are the kind of things that really scare the, uh, the smaller owners and, and make them kind of fear this program. We think there should be a lot more people in this program. We think it's a, it's a great program. It has done more to conserve woodland than anything else in the state of Maine. But that, that fear of those changes and being stuck and then penalized, either removed, kicked out for something or having to get out and pay a huge penalty because the penalties are purposely very high I mean, they're kept very high, uh, often much more than you would have saved if you were at not, uh, that you've saved by being in the program. So those are our objections. You know, if there are laws being broken about the transportation of wood, we have no problem enforcing them, but we think this is the wrong mechanism. And I would say, I think this has a three strike, as written, it has a three strike provision. I would hope after the first strike that whoever collects that information gives it to the appropriate people to enforce the law. With that, I'd, I urge you to uh, oppose this bill. Great, thank you, Mr. Doak. Um, just have a, a question. How, what is the size of the small woodlot uh, owner to be a member of your organization? What's the sort of maximum on that for small woodlot owner? We don't really set the number, but it would be, a, you know, the maximum size would generally be a few thousand acres, something like that. And, you know, the, if we're talk, I, mean, I believe with this, we're talking about 50,000 acres right, and more, so right, this wouldn't really apply right. to the small woodlot owners, right? As, as I mentioned, it, as written, it doesn't. Our concern is you're bringing the idea of bringing something unrelated into the program. And then the concept of now holding somebody, uh, now holding uh, a landowner responsible for something that is unrelated or, or not of their actions is part of the Trigo Tax Law Program. That's our concern. Hmm. Okay, that's that one. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Doak, thank you for being here. Um, a, a quick question. You said you hoped that um, whoever uh, found that the, um, the the folks doing the trucking of the of the forest products um, that, that were in violation would be reported to the appropriate authority. Do you know who the appropriate authority is on this matter? I, I don't. I assume it's the Department of Labor. I'm assuming I'm assuming it's either the state or federal Department of Labor. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us, uh, Mr. Doak, appreciate it. Um, so well, that concludes all the testimony from those in opposition. We're now gonna move to those neither for nor against, starting with Donald Mancius, followed by Jay Wadley. Is Donald Mancius with us? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the committee. My name is Donald Mancius. I'm Director of Forest Policy and Management for the Maine Forest Service, speaking on behalf of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Uh, neither for nor against the bill. Uh, we understand it's been a challenging time for the forest products industry, uh, the pandemic, mill closures, the explosion of the J mill in particular have all uh, posed unprecedented market challenges for the industry. In response, uh, the administration and our staff in the department have been working collaboratively with stakeholders, including the federal delegation on many of these uh, important issues. Uh, for example, last fall, Commissioner Beal wrote a letter to the USDA uh, secretary asking the USDA to add loggers and haul haulers, truckers, to the coronavirus food assistance program. And uh, we were pleased when the last uh, COVID-19 relief package included $200 million for loggers and truckers. Uh, I'm uh, just going to uh, tighten up my testimony a little bit since a lot of the points have already been made. Uh, we are... Uh, most concerned with the language uh, concerning the Trigo tax law. As it's been stated uh, repeatedly, the Trigo tax law was created to support and promote long-term forest management through the appropriate valuation of working forest land. 
and the program stability has been central to a success over the last four plus decades. Uh, we don't see the nexus uh, between taxation of forest land and the hauling of forest products. As uh, others have pointed out, the truckers are independent contractors. Landowners really do not uh, control what those truckers do. Uh, we also have concerns about the principle of equal treatment uh, regarding the application to landowners who own more than 50,000 acres. Uh, should the committee choose to work, uh, move forward with some version of this bill, uh, we uh, are okay with section one, which can be incorporated into the regular activities of uh, Maine's forest rangers. Uh, I do want to note that uh, based on what uh, I've heard the proponents uh, present this morning. Uh, we'd like to have the chief forest ranger at the work session to answer questions about trip tickets and anything to do with law enforcement matters. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Happy to answer questions now or at work session. Great. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Is there questions from members of the committee? Representative Matlock? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Um, in follow up to um, something Mr. Doak said, who is the um, enforcement authority with regard to whether or not truckers can transit between um, locations within the state of Maine? Uh, like Mr. Doak, I'm going to take a guess that it's the Department of Labor. Uh, the Maine Forest Service is not uh, the law enforcement arm for labor laws. Um, what are they in the enforcement arm for? We enforce the state's forest practices laws, timber trespass, uh, fire safety regulations, things like that. Okay. Um, and what would what would section one add to um, the the uh, amendments that uh, Senator Jackson proposes in section one? What would they add to the enforcement authority of the Warren wardens? It, it uh, right now, the existing law allows. Uh, for strangers to uh, obtain uh, copies of trip tickets from the truck drivers. This would add the owners or managers of log mills and log yards. Uh, and uh, that, so that basically it, it allows them to go to the mill or the log yard and, and ask for the trip tickets as opposed okay. to just asking the trucker. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Terry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mancius. Would you, since you are returning and, and the forestry service is coming to the work session, could you check in with the DOL to see if they are, um, in fact, the uh, proper enforcement, I guess? Um, yes. Uh, or, you know, uh, ha you're welcome to invite them to attend with you. We'll, we'll happily listen to them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions to members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Mancius. Appreciate you being with us today. Uh, so that concludes, uh, actually, so now we're in the, the foreigner against, we've got two more speakers. Um, we'll now hear from Jay Wadley, followed by Melinda Boucher. Uh, not quite good afternoon, we're getting close, but uh, my name's uh, Jay Wadley, Senator Chapman, Representative Terry, members of the committee. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm a former member of the Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission, uh, and I represented workers on that board. Canada does a real good job of protecting its workers. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about the rules they have and how they protect them, but they do a good job. And we have rules that prohibit point to point. Um, I know that's been a bit of a discussion among the landowners who said H2A is okay. If they're correct and H2A is okay, then they shouldn't have to worry about any violations coming from that. Um, cause the penalties only happen the way I read it, if there's a violation of law. So if what they're doing is legal, then they have nothing to worry about. Um, but it seems that the federal government's reluctant to expend the resources on enforcement. Maybe they don't have them. Uh, I know it's been kicked around from different who, who does enforce it. Um, everybody from ICE to department of labor. Um, but if we want fair trade and we want to protect main workers, we need to take some action. If you can't count on the federal government to do it, we got to do something ourselves as a state. 30 years ago, uh, landowners like Great Northern, IP, and Irving, they all had employees, thousands of employees. They wanted to change those over to be independent contractors. And when they did that, they got to shed their health care, they got to shed their pensions, they got to shed all of that. Um, but we can't let them shed responsibilities for law, law violations. So if, if they're still ultimately responsible for laws being violated on their behalf, be it they're independent contractors or not, 
We need to do something about it. And there is the three strike rule in there. So if like Mr. Carlisle said, and a couple of the other ones, if they see a violation and they fire the guy, uh, how many contractors out there are going to continue to violate if they know the result is they'll be fired? So number one, there actually has to be a violation. And if H2A isn't, then there's nothing to worry about. Number two, if they do take care of their people and they fire them, they'll never get to a third violation. Um, so I'm in, I'm in favor of anything that promotes fair trade. And that's what I'm looking for here. Um, this bill may do it. It may need to be more severe. Maybe the penalty should be longer. So that's why I'm speaking neither for nor against, but we do have to do something to promote fair trade between, between uh, the Canadians and ourselves. Great, thank you, Mr. Wadley. Is there a question from members of the committee? I don't see any. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Appreciate thank your you. testimony. We'll now hear from Melinda uh, Boucher, Boucher from Fort Kent. Yeah, Boucher. Uh, do you guys uh, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and distinguished members of the Taxation Committee, it has come to my attention that there is another bill, LD 188, this session targeting H2A employees and employers utilizing this program. I am an H2A processing agent for Northridge Services doing business as the Liu Company in Fort Kent, and for eight years now have been working hand in hand with these employers to ensure all federal and state regulations are followed. The H2A process is without a doubt, not an easy process for these employers. It is time sensitive and quite an intense process with no guarantee for these employers that they will be getting an I-94 DHS arrival department record issued to aliens who are admitted to the US by USCIS for the employees they need. There are at this time, nine employers utilizing the H-2A program, requesting 95 workers in which not all positions are, are occupied. These companies are located in Northern Narosta County to Western Somerset County. Employers utilizing this program are in remote locations where laborers are simply not close to the work sites or just don't want to work based on the job requirements. The employers are obligated to hire U.S. American workers under all federal regulations. Please note, all employers would hire skilled American workers but are simply unable to find them despite following all federal requirement regulations. The H-2A process is a federally regulated program overseen by the U.S. Department of Labor. Not only do employers have to follow federal regulations, but also have state regulations to abide by. That being said, this program is heavily regulated by U.S. DOL and the Maine Department of Labor. Employers undergoing federal audits almost every year and enforcement of state regulations daily. There are no state nor federal laws violated by these employers. There, are, there has been inaccurate misinformation targeting the H-2A program, which results in stress on these H-2A employers. Please note these employers are following all federal and state regulations are doing and are doing above and beyond what is required of them in order to obtain these certifications. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you need any information, I'd be pleased to send it. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Boucher. A uh, question from Representative Matlock, followed by Representative Terry. Thank you, Senator, and welcome, um, Ms. Boucher, to our meeting. Uh, you can answer my questions about H two A's. I was um, yes, I was waiting for my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so, so you say there are there are uh, ninety five. Is that a number set by the federal government as to how many H two A's are available? I, I'm wondering if it's like the the, the employment of summer workers for yes. local restaurants. Yes, um, no, the, the H-2A program is, is not like the H-2B program. The H-2B program is, is what they refer to as capped, a cap program. Um, they are only allowing a certain amount of H-2Bs um, into US. The H-2A program is not, um, it does not have a max or a min. Um, it does not okay. have, a, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, was, so how do employers need to prove that they cannot get American workers to do the job at um, American wages, or or how do they how do we ensure that American workers aren't being shut out because um, they don't they cannot um, uh, accept a, a a low wage like a Canadian worker may or driver may in order to do the job? What is the responsibility of the employer? 
Yes, um, you hit two po two good points, which I'd also like to hit on. Um, the, the wages is one thing we have to abide by um, with regulations of the federal regulations. We have to abide by uh, state prevailing wages in order to hire these um, U.S. workers. Um, and the state prevailing wages um, is pretty much a minimum um, per job title that you will be doing. So if you do hire a log truck driver, um, we cannot be giving a U.S. less money than a Canadian or vice versa, I'm going to say. Um, so yes, that would be number one on wages. Um, number two would be the, re the requirement of the regulations based on the recruitment of U.S. workers. Um, so if you are under the H-2A program and you are um, requesting these H-2A workers, you have to, by federal regulations, um, provide proof um, that you have done, um, obviously, abide by the regulations, which are three journal, journal advertisements. Um, in which they tell you where you have to advertise. Um, so we have to advertise in the state of Maine. Um, we have no choice but to advertise through the Bangor Daily News. Um, mm -hmm. We cannot do any local advertisement um, through a little community uh, journal. It has to be through Bangor Daily. And then we have to do through New Hampshire and Vermont advertisements. Um, it has to be on a large circula circulative excuse me, day. Um, so it has to be on a Friday to a Saturday, a Saturday advertisement. Um, so we, we hold a Friday advertisement in the Bangor Daily, and we also hold a Saturday slash Sunday because there's no newspaper on Sunday. Um, they combine them. So we do two advertisements in Bangor Daily, and we do uh, one on Friday for New Hampshire and Vermont. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been very informative. Will you be back on for our, our um, work session? I, I was not planning to, but if you guys need me to, I will most definitely be there for you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Terry. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Boucher. Boucher I appreciate you being here and definitely answered a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, the, the 95 um, visas that are currently um, uh, out there, correct? Yes. Um, yes. Are, are they in different industries or just in essentially just in this industry? Uh, no, and, and I also, that's a, good, that's a good question. I also want to mention too, um, in, although I've only been doing this for eight years now, uh, processing um, for these H-2As, I also have um, background in the wood industry. I also broker wood. Um, so yes, I know a lot of the, um, you know, all, like all the other parties were stating uh, trip tickets, you know, the wood industry, I'm very involved in that as well. So that's a great um, asset. But as well, I also know a lot of the history of the H-2As. And I will tell you that um, there, a lot of people have stated that, um, you know, the forest industry is not agricultural, but however, it, it has been agricultural as an H-2A for the last 11 to 12 years now. Um, there has been controversy about why we are linked into that program, um, and, and that's, that's, that's up to the federal U.S. Department of Labor to make that decision. So they have linked us into an H-2A um, because it is agricultural, and these are seasonal workers. Um, so they cannot be um, more than seasonal requirements are no more than 10 months of the year. Okay, so they're partially um, uh, in the wood industry, but they're also partially in in picking agri uh, you know regular seasonal agriculture picking or so, harvesting that is. Yeah, so um, the, the the employers that I mentioned um, that utilize these H two A's, um, which I think um, I think I cover them all. <laughs> So I can tell you um, personally that they are all under logging. Um, the, these classifications are entail um, a feller buncher operator, a processor operator, a grapple skitter operator, a truck driver, a crane, everything that's associated in the logging industry is underneath this H-2A program. Okay, okay. Um, and then just um, uh, to follow up on your advertisement for jobs for yeah. American workers. So what you're saying is that that someone in say Northern Aroostook County has to get the Bangor Daily News in order to find one of these jobs? We, um, yes, that's a requirement um, of the advertisement part, but we also um, are required by the Department of Labor um, regulations to go on the main career site. Um, so anyone that has, um, that is filing unemployment yep. um, actually has that linkage through the Department of Labor's career sites to find these jobs. Yeah, and nothing local though. There's no local, uh, there's no local advertisement for these jobs? 
Um, nothing local, only because the U.S. Department of Labor requires the largest circulation. And, and it's tough because, um, like, I might have one, one employer in northern Aroostook, but I might have another employer, um, you know, in, in the western Somerset. So the local advertisements, the Department of Labor requires us to do the largest circulation um, mm -hmm. to kind of hit all areas of Maine based on the fact that um, it, they are. They, they, I know a lot of people have said that they are, they're not remote areas, but, but if you look at the map, they are considered remote areas where there is no grocery store, um, you know, so it's, it's very hard to find the, the employees um, that want to go into these um, <laughs> work sites. I'm trying to not yeah, steer my, no. direct, my decision <laughs> on the bill just trying to give you guys a, you know um, educational information to make your decision yeah, of course of course I understand okay thank you so much I you're very welcome yeah um yeah no, so I'm just wondering um Ms. Boucher maybe you can help me understand the disconnect because I I know there's a, a high un unemployment rate in Aroostook County it's higher than almost any other area of the state uh, there are people looking for work we've heard testimony that there's people that haul wood that are looking for work um, where's the disconnect? How come you're not able to locate those people and hire them as opposed to hiring people from? Yep. From um, and, and I'm going to take my, um, my experience in the wood industry now, not as the H2A processing, um, to give, give you my information or my, my knowledge. Um, it's not just the H2A employers that are having difficulty finding these employees. It, it's, it's an, it's the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, and I hate to say it, but the, these are not, I know, I know the wood industry is a very unique industry. Um, and if you do not understand it, it's very, um, it's not challenging to understand, but there's just a lot to it. So I, all I'm going to say is my personal opinion is that these are skilled and I hate to use that word, but it's truly the honest, um, my honest opinion. It, it's there's skilled workers. Um, you know, you cannot myself, um, if I were to, to apply for this, uh, failure puncher position, you know, I'm a U.S. worker. I, I have, you know, all the knowledge of the forest industry and the wood industry. However, I have zero experience running a feller buncher operator, uh, to be a feller buncher operator. Um, these equipment, these pieces of equipment are, are, are expensive. Um, they are not just, you know, jump in a car and, and take drive. Um, you know, if you have a license, it's, it's something that is, takes time um, to learn. And uh, a fellow venture operator, the requirements uh, for an H-2A is six months experience. Um, so just as long as a U.S. worker, um, if applies for the job, uh, pr proves this knowledge, or this set, you know, on, we have applications uh, that they fill out. So if they show that they have six months experience, um, then they automatically have to get hired by U.S. Department of Labor's rules and regulations. So... Uh, any other questions, members of the committee? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Let's go ahead, Representative Carmichael. Uh, Mr. Bouchier, um, do you have a sense that, that this is a program that can be easily abused by contractors? Sorry, what was that, Representative? That, well, there's been a lot of suggestion in testimony today that this may be a program that can be easily abused by contractors. And uh, do you have a sense about whether that's something that can easily happen or something we should look, you know, as the proper? Um, so, so this is very hard of me to answer without um, siding on one side or another, but I'm just here to um, give you guys the knowledge um, of the programs. And, and I'm going to say that um, without a doubt, it's extremely tough to not follow the rules because like I said, we, we have the Department of Labor who, re who um, initially regulates this program um, pretty much at me weekly, daily, um, you know, uh, providing, asking for proof of this. Um, you know, there's so much that goes into this program. It, it's not just, you know, oh, here's my um, I-94. It, it's not that. It, it's so much more, you know, these U.S. companies have to provide proof um, that the taxes have been paid on this equipment, that the company is a U.S. company that, you know, and I, and I could keep you here and, and tell you all the regulations. So to, to say that this is happening, um, I'm going to stand here and tell you that I honestly 
do not think this is happening um, because we would be notified. Um, these H2A employers would be calling me saying, hey, you know, we have an issue. This has happened, um, such and such. And um, knock on wood, we've been very lucky with the audits, the federal audits. And we have been very uh, fortunate with our Department of Labor to provide them the documentation that they need uh, to undergo the regulation of the program. Thank you, very enlightening. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, great, thank you. Uh, is there any additional questions to members of the committee? Um, seeing none, thank you, Ms. Boucher, for your testimony today. Um, and I believe we have one more person that would like to speak, uh, Mr. Delisandro, who didn't get signed up on our list for some reason. But Mr. Delisandro, would you like to offer testimony either for or against? Yes, I would. Thank you. Um, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the Taxation Committee, good afternoon. My name is Daniel D'Alessandro, and I'm an attorney for the Office of Tax Policy from Maine Revenue Services. I'm today. I'm here today at the request of the administration to testify not for or against LD 188. The bill has several issues um, that are unclear and make it not administratable as currently written. In addition, we are unable to de determine the fiscal impact or administrative costs without further clarification, but they could be significant. Um, as the Senate president said, we have met with the sponsor and raised our concerns and appreciate the steps that the sponsor has taken to address those concerns. We await uh, amendment language and would appreciate the opportunity to make further comment at that time. The administration looks forward to working with the committee on the bill and representatives from MRS will be here for the work session to provide additional information. Um, I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have now. Are there any questions uh, from Mr. D'Alessandro from members of the committee? Um, yes, Representative Carmichael. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Distant Senator, I can't pronounce your last name, I apologize. Um, I do have a question. It, it, is part of the administration's concern with this, the um, enforcement mechanism that the, the sponsors have chosen to put into the bill? Um, so as written, the enforcement mechanism is a little, a little unclear. We have a violation by the truck driver, then linked to the landowner, then linked to tax penalties, and then further linked to other state funds and other credits. And so there are details that are missing in that process that make it difficult to envision how it would be administered at this point. But the Senate president did speak to, to changes to the bill to address some of those concerns. So I think I'd like to wait to see that amended language really get into that. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us, Mr. Delisandro. Appreciate it. Um, thank you. So that concludes the testimony on LD 188. So we'll now close the work session on this bill and we will move right into the, um, sorry, the public hearing on this bill and we'll move right into the public hearing on LD 179 that's sponsored by Representative Kessler who's here to introduce that bill um, for us today. Representative Kessler with us. Yeah, there he is. Welcome. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. You're on. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Let me get myself queued up here. Um, I just want to say uh, I appreciate getting to you guys at your hungriest hour. So I, I uh, hope you were able to get my testimony before uh, the committee hearing and feel free to read along if you wish. Um, but uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation, I am Representative Chris Kessler and I represent District 32, part of South Portland and part of Cape Elizabeth. I also serve on the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, and I am an energy auditor by my profession. Uh, and today I am proud to be before you to present LD-179, an act to exclude energy efficiency improvements from property tax. I believe that it is 
of utmost importance for this committee to consider for what purpose we use our constitutional authority to levy taxes. Tax policy can be a tool to encourage economic activity that achieves good outcomes for our communities. We may afford developers tax credits to set up a business in our community in order to create jobs, or we afford low-income households tax credits to give them economic security. When such tax policy is successful, it benefits the entire state. Last session, this committee and the legislature passed LD 1430, an act to create tax equity among renewable energy investments. That legislation was introduced because property tax policy was in direct opposition to the state's renewable energy goals. There was inconsistency in how municipalities assessed solar for property tax purposes. And in some municipalities, the tax assessed was an impediment to development. In all cases, it was viewed as an unfair penalty. Unfortunately, that same problem still exists today for investments in energy efficiency, particularly with ductless heat pumps. Um, and I just have to note that uh, this bill was, was really spawned by my, my own personal experience when I was looking um, at how much my home was assessed for and had then discovered uh, this situation. So because an outdoor unit for a ductless heat pump is attached to the building, some municipalities have decided to assess a tax on the heat pump as an additional feature. Values for heat pumps vary across communities if it's included in the valuation at all. In South Portland, an average of $4,600 value is placed on a single zone installation. Our homes and businesses have been converting to heat pumps to lower their heating bills and get off fossil fuels. And the city has thus far assessed over 400 heat pumps. The total assessed value of ductless heat pumps in South Portland is currently around $2,180,000. If you are looking at my testimony, I provided an example of what this costs the average homeowner. So uh, if our mill rate in South Portland, it's $1,975 per thousand dollars, that that means each home that has just one heat pump uh, pays an additional $90.85 in property taxes. It may be more if they have a larger unit. This begs many questions for me though. Uh, for example, a person might invest in a heat pump for the same reason they might convert to natural gas and install a Renai heater to lower their heating costs and improve comfort in the winter. Or uh, they may have a central AC system and that may be installed to improve comfort in the summer. The ductless heat pump is assessed a tax as an additional feature, whereas the other two systems are not. How is this equitable treatment? Should, should HVAC equipment be taxed simply because it's more efficient? What does this look like to a low income household that finally was able to invest in efficiency for their home. For simplicity, I provided an apples to apples comparison of the cost of heating a small home with an oil boiler versus a ductless heat pump, assuming a 100% conversion. So 100% of the heating load is covered. Um, the, the cost of heating comparisons and installation costs themselves are taken from Efficiency Maine's website. Um, and you'll see with, with oil at 180 a gallon, as it has been over the fall, um, compared to electricity at 17 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, that homeowner would, would save approximately $171 per year. Um, if you look further down on the, the small table there, um, the equipment cost is 3750 uh, Efficiency Main offers low-income rebates for heat pumps uh, at $2,000, so the uh, net install cost is $1,750. However, their savings is cut in half through this uh, assessed tax. 
Um, so the property tax assessed on the ductless heat pump doubles the payback period for the homeowner well beyond the equipment's life expectancy, which is about 15 years. The intent is to install a heat pump, or the in intent to install a heat pump was to save energy and thus save money. And it's important to note that the cost of oil will fluctuate wildly, and so savings will vary from year to year, but it begs the question, is this fair tax policy? It's important to note that five other states exempt energy efficiency improvements. Arizona, Maryland, Nevada, New York, and Virginia. And New York's exemption has been in place since 1977. Uh, I provided a link in the testimony too, so you can see uh, uh, where that is referenced from. As the Honorable Ryan Tipping stated in his testimony last year, exempting solar from property taxes supports the reinvestment of energy dollars into the local economy. The same applies in this case. Although we might not be dealing with the many thousands of dollars of taxes that was imposed on a single solar array, that $90 is uh, someone saves could otherwise be spent on their electric bill, a local restaurant, or a few Christmas presents under the tree. Every little bit helps. As a policy of our state, we should be doing everything we can to encourage investment in energy efficiency. This bill is a starting point to address the inconsistency in how efficiency is valued. This committee, the legislature and the governor all agreed that our tax policies should match our climate goals with the passage of LD 1430. Uh, this committee should pass LD 179 this session for the same reason. Thank you very much for listening and I'll be glad to answer any questions that I can. Thank you, Representative Kessler. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Representative Matlock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, Representative Kessler. Um, good afternoon. A, a quick question for you. Um, is this an inconsistency with assessment? Because I believe that was one of the big problems we had last year with the legislation was the inconsistency between assessors and municipalities deciding whether and when to assess value to solar arrays, is this also an inconsistency with assessor, assessors across municipalities, between municipalities, to determine whether or not to assess or how to determine at what point you do? Absolutely, there's there's a great inconsistency across municipalities from, you know, it, it, including that as just what you view as the heating system to varying uh, values. Like for example, forty six hundred dollars is certainly not how much I I paid for the installation of my heat pump, um, and so it will vary from house to house in South Portland, and different municipalities will will vary on the value. Can I ask another question? Uh, with regard to air conditioning units, are they generally internal or do they have external pieces and that's um, a tax, it's taxable because you can see it? Yeah, so um, uh, if you are looking at a central air conditioning system, yes, there, there will be a condenser unit on the outside of the house. So you can certainly see that. And, and, and when the house is given its uh, assessment, that is one of the factors that, that plays into the overall value of the home, um, mm -hmm. but, but it's certainly not um, added on as an extra feature like a tuckless heat pump is. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Krasik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Kessler, I'm assuming that these new taxes are being put on to these heat pumps when they go in to apply for their plumbing permit to put the to do the new installation. I, I'm not guessing that there's a assessor going to everybody's house to see if they have one in their backyard or not. Is, is that what's happening in your district? Uh, I can't say for, for certain the exact method in which they identify them, but that is certainly one way or also upon the sale of the property. Okay, and there's no depreciation involved. So once they assess this on your property, that value is going to stay on your um, for the value of your home forever, even though 10, 15 years from now, 
if it was any other kind of equipment where you could depreciate, um, that value is going to stay even if it's 10, 15 years old. Is that correct? Um, I can't answer that with uh, certainty, but I can say that uh, there, there are certainly older heat pumps that I have identified in, in South Portland on that home's value that has not changed over time. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Energy questions, anything. Seeing none, thank you for being with us today and sorry for the long wait. I know you've been waiting for a while. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, I, don't thank think you very much, else, I don't see if there's anybody else signed up to speak in support of the bill, but we do have um, folks that want to speak in opposition to the bill, starting with Brenda Cummings, followed by Kate Dufour. Brenda Cummings with us. Yeah, she's up. Uh, Ms. Cummings. I think I've got it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> go ahead. Welcome, Ms. Cummings. Hi. Thanks. Just give me a, just a second. I, I didn't know you were coming to me so quickly. <laughs> so I want to modify my, my, I prepared a written statement that I will submit. Um, I'll modify it slightly as I go through this. Um, thank you very much, Senator Chipman and Representative Terry and members of the Taxation Committee for allowing me to testify today about LD-179. My name is Brenda Cummings, and I'm the assessor for the city of Bath, Maine, as well as a resident of Bath, Maine. Um, I'm testifying today personally as a representative of my profession, not on behalf of the city of Bath. Um, and I'm speaking against LD-179, an act to exclude energy efficiency improvements from property tax. I want to start out by saying I am personally should I turn on my camera? I don't, I don't know why yeah. I'm not, I don't have a video. Let me just check to see yeah. if I can Go turn that on. The video. You might have to do that on your end. Um, Hang on. Yeah, there you see. go. Now you can see me. Hi. Um, I'm personally a very strong supporter of energy efficiency and converse, conservation measures. My parents' house has solar panels and my father, Bob Cummings, wrote a book on building energy efficient houses which he passed out to constituents in his district when he ran for the state Senate in the 1980s. Um, I regularly go to the library book sale every year to collect copies so I can give them away to somebody else. Um, however, LD-179 as written would dramatically change assessment practices and increase costs significantly and undermine basic property assessment principles. Let me explain why. So, there are a lot of misconceptions of what assessors do in what um, the sponsor has described um, to you. Appraisers and assessors both value real property. We're both seeking to identify a market value, what the main constitution calls the just value of a property. Appraisers value one property at a time. Assessors value all of the property in our jurisdictions at once. The simplified version of how we do that is to say we look at the characteristics of properties that have sold, establishing the market indicated value of various styles of buildings, their conditions, the quality of their kitchens and bathrooms, um, the age of the property, and any other factor that appears to impact the valuation of a home. We then generalize from those sales to all of the properties in our jurisdictions, quantifying, estimating, the value added or subtracted by various property characteristics. And we estimate the value of the properties that haven't sold by applying those values um, that we've created from the properties that have sold um, to all of the properties. So one problem with LD-179 is that assessors don't collect the details of personal appliance choices when collecting data on property sales. And indeed, we wouldn't have any source of such information. We don't detail brands or energy efficiency ratings for appliances or energy efficiency measures in every resident's home. We have in Bath maybe 70 to 120 market sales each year, and we value about 3,800 real estate parcels. We have limited existing data that would indicate how market value of a property might change due to the installation of any particular energy efficiency improvement. 
outside of limited information on the valuation impact of various types of heating systems. So the example that you used about um, a heat pump is probably one of the few things we could actually put some kind of number to. But in general, we have no source of data to apply to implementing this bill. The real estate market in Maine doesn't describe the energy efficiency ratings of the properties for sale. There's no source for market data to, con to determine the correct exemption amounts to be applied. And figuring out the valuation impact would be statistically really difficult to establish because there's too much detail, too many distinctions between each type and specific installation of energy improvements. So one of the, this, you, you've talked about the $90 value in South Portland for, or the $90 tax amount in South Portland for a heat pump. Well, South Portland may have been able to distinguish the value of a heat pump and have set it at whatever they've set it at, but, and Bath might be able to extract the value of what a heat pump might add to the overall value of a house, but our job is to value the overall value of a house and the land. It's not the assigning of a number to that item is a mechanism to get to the big number. It's not, um, it's not definitive in and of itself. And in terms of what the value is of that heat pump, um, it's, an, it's an estimating process. Let me give you an example. Let's talk about fireplaces. Most assessment systems count the number of fireplaces in a home and add value to a property based on the number of fireplaces. The amount of value a fireplace adds to a particular property might vary depending on the style or the condition of the house, whether it's in good condition, poor condition. Um, the value will, added will likely vary based on whether the fireplace is a traditional fireplace or it's fueled by gas or electricity. We establish those amounts and how they might vary by looking at property sales in our communities. The valuation changes created in Bath by a fireplace addition might not be the same as the valuation changes that a fireplace creates in Brunswick or Phippsburg. It's gonna depend on the market, on the market forces in our towns. But it would be extremely difficult to quantify the valuation differences between one brand of electric fireplace or another, or the difference between the valuation between one with a two foot opening versus a three foot opening. And Ms. Cummings, could you give us a final thought? We do try to ask people to stick to three minutes if we could, and we're, we're well over that now. Really? Wow, sorry. Um, I think it's important for the legislature to consider the larger picture of tax, tax, property taxation. Um, we are required to implement Article 9, Section 8, which states all of the Constitution, which states all taxes on real and personal estate shall be apportioned and assessed equally according to the just value thereof. All property tax exemptions break that promise because they require all the taxpayers to pay incrementally more to provide the exemption because the exemption creates a smaller tax base. Unless the legislature fully reimburses that exemption, you are penalizing communities that might want to create a program to support energy efficiency by creating, making their tax bills go up. Um, I applaud the legislature's interest in promoting energy efficiency, but there are other methods of providing tax breaks and incentives for energy efficiency that spread the impact of those tax breaks more fairly like creating the income tax or sales tax exemption um, for energy efficiency improvements. Those would be much, much easier to quantify and implement than a property tax exemption. Great. I urge well, you to rewrite the bill. Great, thank you, Ms. Cummings. Are there any questions from members of the committee, Representative Terry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cummings. Um, uh, quick question, how long has the city of Bath um, been assessing uh, heat pumps? We had no, uh, since we did a revaluation in 2019, so two and I'm not even sure that we, it's one of several methods of heating that I could choose in my valuation choices. Okay, thank so you. So it's not, I don't count a heat pump and have a dollar amount applied to it. It's 
Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, Representative Kreisler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. Um, so what I'm understanding is if you doing a reevaluation in the town, like we did in Acton uh, several years ago, that my neighbor has an old boiler and I've got a heat pump, the value of my property is more because I have the modern technology. Is that what I'm understanding? I don't know. It would depend on your community. So it depends on the market in your community. Okay. If that, we is, had... is, your, is your property worth more? I mean, if, if you had the exact same house, would your property be worth more? I, I'm saying if we have, because you're taxing the heat pump. So if but I it's have- not, it's not, I'm not taxing the heat pump. I'm taxing okay. the property. Right. So the question is, what is the property worth? Okay, so if I have more technology if, than the house next door, then the, my property would be valued more. It might be, but it would depend on all of the characteristics of your property. Okay, so if the houses were selling- It's just pretty, one factor among many. Okay, so if the houses were selling pretty much the same um, in my neighborhood, having a heat pump is not gonna increase the value of my sale. It should not. Okay, that's what I wanted to, thank you. Additional questions, Representative Grandma. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Ms. Cummings, for coming. So just based on what I'm hearing, correct me if, I'm, if my conclusion is inaccurate, it sounds like there's a great deal of inconsistency amongst assessors and amongst municipalities in terms of whether or not one would include the additional um, home efficiency equipment like a heat pump or not, and to what degree they would include that in, as part of the valuation. Is that Act or mind the ballpark with that assessment, with that assumption? No, we are. No, I think you're misunderstanding the premise again. We are all seeking to value the property according to its just value and apportioned equitably thereof, right? Just what it says in the Constitution the property as a whole. To get to that number, we're going to determine locally what the right factors are. It's just a mechanism for getting to what the value is as a whole. It's not, it's, it's not, um, it looks like you're, you're taxing this one thing, but you're not, you're tax, it's just a piece that goes into the whole value. So if you were to appeal, appeal your valuation, if Rep Representative Kessler were to go to, the, to his local board of property tax review and say, you have valued this, this heat pump too high, what, what the board should tell you is, that's nice that you feel that way, but what you need to prove your case, in order to prove your case, you have to prove that the total value that I have assessed your property for is not the right value. Whether you're your heat pump is at $90 or $200 or $2,000 doesn't matter if the answer is the right answer for the total house, for the total property. I appreciate that. The right answer sounds, in my opinion, a little bit subjective, but we can tease well, this out in the work session. Thank you very much. It's, it's assessment. Additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, um, thank you for being here, Ms. Cummings. I appreciate it. Um, and next we will hear from Kate DeFore uh, to speak in opposition, followed by Dr. Allen for neither for nor against. Welcome, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Taxation Committee. My name is Kate DeFore, and I'm here on behalf of the Maine Municipal Association to provide testimony uh, in opposition to LD uh, 179. And I think you'll find that my testimony is remedial in comparison to the testimony you just heard. Uh, but I want to focus on two policy concerns. And the first is with respect to using the property tax as a means for funding incentivizing state priorities. Um, you know, municipal officials across the state believe that energy efficiency improvements are absolutely important. But the objection here is a turn to the property tax rather than state revenues to fund these incentives. So we establish this principle of our priorities, state priorities are more important than local priorities when you take value away, when you, when you 
when you take value away that's not available to fund a local priority, you're sending a message that state priorities are far more important. So there, there's that policy concern that is troubling. There's another element of the bill that's a bit more troubling, which has to do with assigning this authority to decide what is exempt and what isn't to a quasi organization. So if you read the, if you take a look at the bill, it basically says that the efficiency main trust is directed to create a list of all exempt properties, qualifying exempt properties, and to inform the municipalities of this responsibility. From our perspective, we don't think that that's good public policy because if a third party suddenly gets to decide on its own what is and isn't taxable, we miss out. We miss out on a conversation that we're having today discussing why these exemptions do or don't work. And we also could uh, miss out on the constitutional requirement that you reimburse municipalities for 50% of that loss. So I, I urge you to, um, to really look at that closely that I think there is an abdication of tax policy when you allow another party to decide what is taxable and what is not. And I thank you for your time and consideration and last answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Four. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being here. It's great to see you again. I don't think we've seen you yet since we started up this year. So. Thank you. Um, so that concludes, actually, we're gonna now take testimony from those neither for nor against. That concludes our testimony from those in opposition. But neither for nor against, we have Dr. Allen uh, who'd like to speak uh, to the committee. Is Dr. Allen with us? Welcome, Dr. Allen. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Taxation Committee. My name is Michael Allen. I'm the Associate Commissioner for Tax Policy in the Department of Administrative Services. And I'm here today at the request of the administration to testify neither for nor against LD-179. The bill would require assessors to determine the value added to a property by the eligible energy efficiency improvements. These determinations would be new in kind and scope and administratively challenging. They would require a significant amount of additional work for municipal assessors and main revenue services. In addition, this exemption may have a significant impact on taxpayers by restricting revenue sources from municipalities and in a manner effectively increasing the property tax on residents who cannot afford to add energy efficiency improvements to their properties. The administration feels that consideration should be given to the effect this bill would have on further erosion of the property tax base. On a more technical note, the bill leaves open significant issues in the definition of qualified improvements. While a preliminary fiscal estimate is not available at this time, an exemption of this potential magnitude may affect a significant portion of Maine residents and may result in a substantial annual reimbursement by the state to municipalities through the requirements in the Maine Constitution. In addition, this bill would also place a significant additional workload on municipal assessors requiring a 90% mandate reimbursement for administrative expenses through the requirement in the Maine Constitution. The preliminary administrative cost of the bill is estimated to be 190,000 to 210,000 to fund two new property appraiser positions at Maine Revenue Services to administer the exemption. If it is the desire of the committee to support this legislation, Maine Revenue Services would like the opportunity to work with the committee to consider a number of changes in order to improve the long-term administration of the program. The administration looks forward to working with the committee on the bill. Representatives from MRS will be here for the work session to provide additional information and respond in detail to the committee's questions. Be happy to answer any questions you may have now. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Is there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, um, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for being thank here. You. Um, I don't believe there's anybody else that wants to speak neither for nor against. We will now close the public hearing on LD-179. We will now move to the public hearing for LD-198. At this time, I'm gonna um, pass things over to Representative Terry, since I'm the sponsor of this bill. <laughs> Sounds terrific. 
Thank you, Senator Chipman. And uh, why don't we hear from Senator Chipman on LD198? <laughs> Great. Good afternoon, Representative Terry and colleagues on the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. As you know, I'm Senator Ben Chipman. I'm here today to present LD198. This is an act to improve Maine's tax laws by providing a property tax exemption for central labor councils. If you're, uh, we're on this committee last session, you'll know this is a bill that we heard last year and I believe we passed, but uh, it went to the appropriations table and, and died along with many other bills when we abruptly adjourned because of the pandemic. Um, so just to refresh your memory, um, this bill seeks to address a parity issue. As it stands now, chambers of commerce, fraternal organizations and boards of trade receive a property tax exemption. Central labor councils, however, do not. Central labor councils are important civic-minded institutions in their communities. For example, the Eastern Maine Labor Council in Brewer provides a variety of important social services to the community, including running a program to deliver Thanksgiving meals to workers laid off from their jobs. This bill provides a real property tax exemption for real estate and personal property owned and occupied or used solely for their own purposes by central labor councils. I believe that if organizations advocating for the business community, such as chambers of commerce, can receive the property tax exemption, then labor councils formed by workers deserve the same benefit. In closing, I thank you for your time and attention today. I know we've been running kind of late. Uh, happy to answer any questions now or at the work session. Thank you. Uh, Representative Prizen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Chipman, do you remember what the vote was uh, the last time? Uh, you know, I don't. I, I, I'm not sure if it was unanimous. I know there, I believe there was some Republican support, if not unanimous, but I, I actually don't recall. Maybe someone else on the committee would, or we can find out from Julie. Um, there was strong support. I just don't know if it was unanimous or not. I don't remember. Okay, thank you. I would be willing to bet that our next um, participant might have the answer to that. Um, any other questions for Senator Chipman? Seeing none, uh, up next is uh, uh, in favor of the bill, um, Adam Good with the main AFL-CIO. Welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Representative Terry and Senator Chipman and members of the committee. Um, my name is Adam Good, I'm the Legislative and Political Director with the Maine AFL-CIO. We represent 40,000 working people in the state of Maine, work to improve the lives and working conditions of all working people and testify in support of this bill. Um, I apologize, Representative Prizak, is that the right way to pronounce? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe last session, uh, Representative Bickford voted for this bill. Um, can't speak for him right now, but I, I think that he continues to be supportive of it, at least in concept. Um, and all the Democrats voted for the bill in committee. Um, okay, thank you. And a $1,600 fiscal note. Um, and you know, I don't want to take up a ton of your time. I recognize that I should have some type of tribute to give the committee, which I, I hope that you are keeping uh, a list of IOUs and would love to be added to that list to provide some type of tribute in the future. Right now, you can just see my living room. Um, Central Labor Councils play a very important role in improving the lives of working families. In Maine, there are four Central Labor Councils. One of them, the Eastern Maine Labor Council, has a physical structure and thus currently pays property tax. Uh, leaders of the Eastern Maine Labor Council are able to share about the services they provide. I know at least Jack McKay is planning to testify. Um, they provide many services to the community in Eastern Maine out of the Solidarity Center located in Brewer. Um, these include a Solidarity Harvest where they distribute up to 1,400 Thanksgiving baskets enough to feed over 10,000 people. Uh, they do that every November. It's a giant program that helps you know, mitigate hunger issues and help working families. They have a greenhouse which annually provides seedlings to over 350 families in Bangor and Brewer. Um, they have uh, lots of partnerships with faith communities. They do an annual legislative breakfast that many members from the area have attended. They're on a hotline to support workers to help gain a voice and fairness at work. Um, and just fundamentally, we see this as a parity issue. Chambers of Commerce, boards of trade, fraternal organizations, they all enjoy a property tax exemption. Passing uh, LD-198 would just add central labor councils to that list of organizations receiving the property tax exemption. Uh, and we just think that it's an organization that provides an appropriate balance to the chambers of commerce or other business organizations that currently enjoy a property tax exemption. We think it's only fair that central labor bodies be added to that list. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, I don't don't have a lot of that. It's a very small fiscal note. I know that MMA is is on this Zoom meeting. <laughs> so will testify in some in some aspect, but um, the, the the services that the Solidarity Center and the Labor Council provides the community are broad and helpful, and uh, I don't think that they fit anywhere outside of the political pers perspective, um, political um, spectrum or uh, any of the activities are any different than what chambers of commerce do, what boards of trade do, what fraternal organizations do. So this feels like a very small bill and I'm happy to take a stab at any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Good? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, uh, next up is um, Jack McKay from Brewer and following that will be Jeff McCabe from the MESA, MSEA. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Chipman, uh, Representative Terry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. Um, I'm president of the Eastern Maine Labor Council, and I have been for nearly 20 years, uh, which has 34 affiliated unions representing over 5,000 workers in Eastern Maine. Our mission is to improve the lives and working conditions of our members and all working people in our region. On behalf of the Eastern Maine Labor Council, um, I wish to testify in support of LD-198. Um, LD-198 would rectify gross inequity. Central Labor Councils play a similar role as Chambers of Commerce, and as such help level the playing field between workers and management so that we can have a vibrant, equitable economy with shared benefits for all. However, the playing field is seldom fair and Maine's property tax exemption tilts that playing field in favor of management through property tax exemptions. Currently, chambers of commerce and boards of prey are exempt from property taxes, while central labor councils are required to pay. Um, and I think, you know, there's no like frightening door that might be opened on this. Central labor councils are very resource poor. Um, none of us has paid staff. Uh, our property taxes, which are just under $3,000, constitute about 10% of our total revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, we certainly don't mind paying our taxes, uh, but then chambers of commerce should do as well. <laughs> or if they don't have to, then we shouldn't have to. Um, and as, as Adam said earlier, we do a number of uh, uh, programs to support the community. Um, in addition to the Thanksgiving baskets, which we raise roughly $60,000 that in turn goes to local food producers to provide Thanksgiving meals to people in our community, as well as throughout the state of Maine, uh, which is gifted. Uh, we have a greenhouse on the side of our building, which provides seedlings to over 350 families throughout Bangor and Brewer at a low income housing uh, uh, facilities. And this is all gifted and volunteer run. Um, we also do a number of uh, educational programs. We have a legislative forum, which we're very happy has both Republicans and Democrats attending for over 15 years. Um, and we see LD198 is basic fairness. Um, and we're very much in support of it. I'll be happy to ask any questions about the Eastern Maine Labor Council um, or other central labor councils for that matter. Anyone have any questions for Mr. McKay? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next up is Jeff McCabe of the MSEA. Good afternoon, folks. Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the Committee on Taxation. I am Jeff McCabe, and I serve as the Director of Legislation and Politics for the Maine Service Employees Association, Local 1989. Uh, it's great to be here with the committee today. Uh, we are a labor union representing over 13,000 workers and retirees statewide. Uh, we are here today in strong support of LD-198. Uh, you probably also received some testimony at some point in time from one of our uh, board members who is a uh, DOT worker and very active with the Labor Council and uh, had hoped to be here today, but it is a season where they are plowing and I imagine he had a busy night last night. So uh, here's sort of pinch hitting, but also happy to share some stories. You've heard a little bit about uh, one of the Labor Councils and uh, such a unique 
uh, opportunity that the Labor Council provides and uh, really making a difference statewide and across uh, the region, no doubt. Uh, my trips to the building that houses the Eastern Maine Labor Council have been for education, social gatherings, and events addressing food insecurity issues. Every time I've been there to an event at that location on the banks of the Penobscot River, I have seen young people and older folks all pitching in to make things happen and to support the community. I've talked with staff, interns, volunteers, and others. Uh, several years ago, I drove to the Labor Council building just before uh, Thanksgiving, and I loaded my SUV with food. Picture for a moment, if you will, uh, turkeys, potatoes, cranberry, baked goods made by the community college system, and so much more. All the seats down in my SUV and just uh, room in that SUV for the passenger and driver. We drove that food to Machias to meet workers who had been laid off when the Down East Correctional Facility had closed the previous winter. Driving up there that day, we knew that we had homes for some of the meals. We had, after all, called the workers and families. Each time we described uh, the Solidarity ha Harvest Program, uh, we talked with folks and uh, said union members and others are helping workers, not with charity, but with solidarity. We hope they'd understand. We arrived, we set up a folding table in the parking lot in Machias, just outside Helens, and we sat there waiting for a short period of time. We were reunited with many of the laid off workers, workers that some of you here today in the committee had met. We were met with hugs, tears, and we distributed a couple dozen Thanksgiving baskets that day. I think in these current times, it's so important that we think about ways to return events for social gatherings and for information. So with that in mind, I am also recalling several legislative breakfasts held at Eastern Maine Labor Council and visiting with former colleagues, including a former colleague of uh, many of us, and including myself, the Honorable Richard Campbell. He felt it was always important to attend the Labor Council breakfast, and he looked forward to it each year. And uh, I, I just remember several times standing in the back of the room with him or outside in the parking lot as we talk with folks uh, about that event and about the important programs that occur here. Last fall, my son asked my wife and I when we were planning to go to Brewer to volunteer to sort food for the Solidarity Harvest, something we've done as a family several times before. I had thought, you know, originally we probably wouldn't go because of COVID. And then I quickly learned that it was something that we could do as a family, socially distanced outside and being safe. It was a real special moment for us uh, considering the last year has just been so disruptive for my 12 and 15 year old. And we went and we spent a morning up there packing Solidarity, Solidarity Harvest baskets. Um, it's, it was really a great opportunity and it provided my children an opportunity to, to engage and have some level of normalcy. Uh, when you get my written testimony today, you'll see just sort of how big that effort was. Uh, this year was the 18th annual Solidarity Harvest and that was something that uh, provided over 1400 Thanksgiving meals. I've always been struck with um, you know, the overlap of these programs, not only with labor, but other community groups, faith groups, and so many more who stepped up to help laid off workers in this year, especially during um, a time when so many folks were laid off due to the pandemic. I'm happy to answer any questions and I look forward to seeing this committee uh, again in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. McCabe. Does anyone have any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time. Um, anybody, it uh, doesn't look like we have anybody else uh, in favor of. We have uh, next up Kate Dufour from MMA uh, um, as an opponent. Representative Terry and members of the uh, Taxation Committee, my name is Kate Dufour and I'm here on behalf of the Maine Municipal Association to oppose LD um, 198. I um, want to say we do agree with uh, the proponents of the bill that it's important that all types of organizations are treated fairly. Uh, we certainly agree with Mr. McKay with respect to maybe we need to reevaluate uh, who is exempt in the state. Because if you look at the growing ranks, it seems that, it, in particularly in some communities, the value of the exempt property is outpacing that of taxable property. And you need just look to your service center communities and your poorer source service center communities like Lewiston. So there, there is an issue here where we have a system that requires municipal government services to be funded primarily with property tax um, dollars. 
yet there are influences that dwindle those property tax dollars that are available. And so we think it might be time, rather than having these perpetual discussions about who is, is worth or who's not worth an exemption, because as you heard today, they clearly do good work for the communities, but it's still coming at a cost when we start to do these exemptions to every other property taxpayer that's out there. I mean, the remaining property taxpayers are dwindling. And so again, we think it might be worthwhile to sit down and talk about these property tax policies to see whether or not they're fair, to see whether or not they can be modernized. There are many of these exemptions that went on board when we became a state. So it's, I think it's time to look at that to ensure that communities have the revenues they need to provide services. And when I talk about services, I know it's sometimes very easy to talk about this quote unquote out of control municipal spending. But if you look at your own community's budgets, you'll see that there's a lot of that expense that's mandated. We have to pay for schools. We have to maintain roads. We have to manage solid waste. We have to do all these things. Um, and, and our communities want other things too. Not only do they want good roads, they want libraries. They want par uh, parks and rec programs. So we're just asking when, when will be the right time to have a conversation about how we assess property taxpayers or how we assess property owners across the state so that it's fair and that we are all contributing to the services that we receive. So I thank you for your time and consideration and we'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. DeFord. Does anyone have any questions? Do you, look, may I just yeah. quickly, I don't want to be rude. Oh, that's okay. I was going to ask a question. You go first. Do, you just, do you want me to leave and you call me back in or do you want me to just quietly hover around? Oh, you're coming in again? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I'll probably pull you out of this one, actually. But okay, we'll, cool. We'll, Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll keep you on. I do I do have a question, actually, okay. Kate. Um, is there someone that you have, um, you know, uh, a lot of times um, different organizations will ask a legislator to put together um, a, a legislation to come up with a solution for something is there is there a discussion that you're that you've had or that somebody from MMA has had about coming up with a uh, you know some sort of a not necessarily reformulation but um, you know a, a way to address uh, these kinds of issues you know when folks are asking for exemption after exemption after exemption not that I'm um, saying that this is not the right one to do but um, you know where, where can we get your input? How can we get your input to, to make things happen so it's easier on our municipalities? We, 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 I mean, opportunities like this are, are good, just to, to explain the, our point of view. It's not that we're anti-exemption or anti any, you know, profit. It's just, just to bring some sort of awareness that there's a cost associated with the exemption that is borne by remaining property taxpayers. So more directly to your point, we, we have had conversations in the past. We've engaged in uh, working groups, but like, you know, like any good working group, you develop a really good product and then it sits on a shelf and collects dust. So we've been the victim of shelving, I'll, I'll say. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, it, it relates to the last um, bill as well, you know, if new property is gonna be exempt, we're, we're never gonna grow. And I think we really have to have that conversation. And you know, maybe this year is not the year considering we're all trying to, to survive a pandemic, but it's something we need to discuss in the coming years um, so that we're all on the, on the same footing and that we're all, we're ensuring that you know, not just the property taxpayers are paying for these services, that we're all sharing in that burden. And you know, if every, piece of ta tax exempt property paid just a little bit, our mill rates, mill rates would go way down. So it's, it's that conversation and it has to occur, not piecemeal, it has to be a larger conversation about what are the benefits, um, what, and, and, and at what costs. Right. right. Uh, Representative Gramlich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. DeFore, for being here. Your, um, your, la your answer to Representative Terry's um, question kind of piqued my interest in is prompting this question. So in the same vein of looking at um, the really the whole big picture in terms of tax policy and certainly the implications that particular pieces of tax policy may have on 
municipalities. Um, what I tell my students when I teach social policy is really checking with our assumptions. And so I'm doing that. My assumption is that the Maine Municipal Association would also want to take into consideration the implications of municipal revenue sharing when we look at that type of calculus. Is that not so? Yeah, you'd want to look at the in entire package about, I mean, it gets back to how do we fund local government services? How do we do it? Um, and what revenues are available? Right now, it's primarily the property tax, property taxes that are available. I mean, these conversations, um, you know, somebody there mentioned the three-legged stool. I mean, we started these conversations about how do you tax mix between property income and sales where the property tax is holding, you know, 40, 42, 43% of that burden. So it's, it's all part of that conversation. And, and I think it's an important one to have. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Dufour. I'm gonna kick you out now. <laughs> Um, uh, next up, I believe, is um, someone from MRS. Uh, I thought Dr. Allen, but it looks like perhaps um, Mr. Sagaster. I hope I didn't catch you off guard, Mr. Sagasser. On here, um, you're. I'm sorry, I had to leave and come back. Are you? You're addressing LD one ninety eight. Is that correct? correct? Oh, and it looks like Dr. Allen is here. Yes, so you and might I don't, be off the hook. I don't believe we're testifying on this bill. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, and Dr. Allen, that is fact. You are not testifying on this bill, neither for nor against. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I left and came back, so. So I'm so sorry. So I got a note that you were testifying neither for nor against for LD-198, but is that not the case? Did Mr. Sagasser just? He just said that we, you were not. Uh, um, which one, is this the Labor Council bill? Correct. That, that, that is correct. Okay, my apologies. Thank you. Sorry, I may have read my text wrong. So back <laughs> to lunch with you. <laughs> okay, so uh, seeing that there are no other, um, there is no other testimony for LD-198, this hearing is closed on LD-198. Um, and next up is LD-351. Uh, uh, and um, Representative Foster, I believe, uh, is going to be presenting this bill. Uh, just let you in, Representative Foster. There you are, just perfect. Nice to see you. Yes, good afternoon. I will uh, try to uh, get through this as quickly as possible because I'm sure you folks are ready for lunch. It's been a long morning for you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say good afternoon to Senator Chipman and uh, Representative Terry, distinguished members of the Committee on Taxation. Uh, one housekeeping matter, I believe you received a uh, spreadsheet that I put together, which I'll refer to in my testimony here this afternoon. I am Steve Foster, State Representative for House District 104, which includes the towns of Charleston, Dexter, Exeter, Garland, and Stetson. I stand before you today to, to present and, and in support of LD 351, an act regarding municipal valuation and state-owned property. During the 129th legislature, I was asked by the Town of Charleston Select Board to review their situation regarding the inclusion of the state-owned Mountain View Correctional Facility in their total municipal valuation and to offer legislation should it be warranted. As a result, I'm submitting LD351 for your consideration. In Title 36 MRSA subsection 651, a list of city and town property tax exemptions includes subsection 1B, the property of the state of Maine. This bill proposes that the exemption would be limited to an amount up to 10% 
of the total municipality valuation. Maine's 2019 municipal valuation return statistical summary lists the property tax information for our 487 towns. In regards to a municipality's total land and building valuation, which is the number that I used uh, in my research, state-owned property accounted for 1% or more of the total land and building valuation in 114 municipalities, 5% or more in 24, and 10% or more in only 14. I've included a list of those 14 municipalities with the testimony that I'm presenting. One of the 14 communities, Charleston, is home to the Mountain View Correctional Facility. This facility accounts for 52.9% of the town's total land and buildings valuation. Its 2020 valuation of $33,989,040 increased the town's net assessment for commitment by $545,524 to $1,016,421. Without it, the property taxpayers of Charleston would have paid $470,897. Unlike many of the other 14 towns where state-owned property accounts for at least 10% of the total, Charleston receives little financial benefit from the property. For example, municipalities with a university benefit from employment, spending at local businesses, community access to facilities, et cetera. Mountain View lists a staff of 170 employees. Charleston residents hold a total of 16 of these jobs, less than 10%. Charleston has no stores, no gas stations, or other businesses that might be frequented by employees or visitors to the facility. Last year, MVCF provided community restitution workers to Charleston, whose man hours were valued at $18,012 the only theoretical in lieu of taxes payment. And by the way, surrounding communities also receive benefits from those uh, work crews uh, from the uh, Charleston facility. The town provides fire protection with a small number of calls each year, including washing down the parking lots in the spring. It also helps fund the Penobscot County Sheriff's Office, which provides a portion of law enforcement coverage needed on nearby roadways where travelers to the facility may require it. Two of the towns in the list of 14 are treated differently. A state-owned property in Orono is exempted because the university was designated as a tax-exempt literary institution. A state-owned property in Limestone is not included in the town's total valuation. I was unable to determine the reason. There was a bill, LD 869 from the 116th legislature. Uh, taxation committee at that time was chaired by former Senator and Governor Baldacci. Uh, but in the 116th, it would have reduced limestone's valuation, but from the information I received from the legislative library, the only thing I could find was that it received a unanimous ought not to pass out of committee. It, also, that bill would not have addressed the total exemption that limestone uh, realizes today. I hope from my testimony and the accompanying documents, this committee of the 130th legislature may find a remedy for Charleston's situation. I'm certainly open to any amendment to this bill that would do so, whether it's a change in the percentage of state-owned property that may be exempt, a method to remove the state's property valuation from the total, or some type of carve-out similar to what may have been done for limestone, the town of Charleston and I would be happy to work with you to do so. Thank you for your consideration of this bill. would be happy to answer any questions you may have and will make myself available for your work session. I would like to, if I may, uh, address the, uh, the spreadsheet with a list of 14 towns. When I put this together uh, some time ago when preparing this bill, I used the total valuation of uh, land and buildings to come up with my percentage numbers. Uh, this morning, while waiting for the opportunity to testify today on this bill, I recalculated using the total uh, state-owned property valuation and uh, I will only say I will get that spreadsheet to you folks uh, as soon as we leave here. I'll send it to your clerk. But uh, one town changed uh, enough to, to change the list, and that would be the town of Mercedes, which dropped uh, significantly down to about 6%. So they would not be actually included in this uh, benefiting from this bill. No other towns in the list. And I also sent to the clerk for your 
review a spreadsheet of all of the towns in Maine showing the percentage of state owned property in their municipality. Uh, no other town actually was boosted up to uh, 10% or more or above 10% of state owned property by uh, recalculating using that total property value. So I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to present this bill to you. Uh, you'll see on the spreadsheet that Charleston, uh, they're a farming community for the most part. And uh, when you compare, for instance, uh, their town to towns in York County or the even the counties of Penobscot and others to some of our, what we would call uh, more well-off counties in the state and municipalities in the state, uh, they hold a significant uh, uh, burden, if you will, by having the uh, correctional center there with no uh, real significant financial benefit to the community. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Representative Foster. Has anyone got any questions? I'm glad we gave you the opportunity to do a little extra work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your thank you for waiting very long. For I appreciate that. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, so next up uh, is Terry Lynn Hall from Charleston. Ms. Hall, you should be uh, a participant, um, a panelist at this point, and uh, just will need to unmute your mic and start your video, or just unmute your mic. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good okay. Good afternoon. I'm not really good with technology. That is okay. We can hear you and that's all that matters. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Well, first and foremost, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the Taxation Committee on doing your due diligence in reviewing the Bill LD 351 in all of the documentation that you have received and the financial impact on our small community is enormous. Representative Foster just went over all the numbers, so I won't recap them for you as you've already had a very long day. <laughs> but as taxpayers elect their officials to serve in Augusta, they entrusted all of you to do due diligence in representing them and completing the tasks at hand that you are assigned, always keeping your constituents' best interest at heart. As Mountain View has expanded over the past 30 years, their value has increased. Mountain View has provided restitution in Charleston, which is deeply appreciated but they also provide those same services and more for all the towns surrounding Charleston. Since last March, restitution has been minimal because of COVID, which we totally understand because it's all for safety. On several occasions, Charleston officials have testified in Augusta for Mountain View to expand or keep the facility open. The town of Charleston and Mountain View have a good working relationship. The town of Charleston is not asking the state to do any more than any other landowner in the state of Maine is required to do in order to own property. The town of Charleston has always had a liaison between the facility as well as governor appointed members to their advisory board and their board of visitors. The past 30 years, it has been a member of the board of selectmen and that person has been me. I have served on the board of selectmen for 33 years in our community. But a brief synopsis of the town of Charleston we are located about 25 miles northwest of Bangor. It has long been recognized as a bedroom town. 
the people that moved to Charleston is for the school district, the quietness, and the fact that Charleston is a close knit community. We have no industry, no convenience stores, gas stations, anything of that sort. All the taxpayers of Charleston must travel for their employment, which is all by their choice, but they choose to do it in, to, in order to live in a quiet, connected community. As this current concern has been for our community for a very long time, we do want to express our gratitude to Steve Foster on sponsoring this bill. We as a community have been requesting this in excess of 30 years. So once again, thank you, Steve. But in closing, please keep in mind when you're voting on LD351, the positive impact that will have on the taxpayers of Charleston and we certainly thank you for your time and your consideration on Bill LD 351. Thank you very much, Ms. Hall. And thank you again for waiting so long for us. Sometimes committee work can be very, very long. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much uh, again. We appreciate your, your testimony. Um, uh, next up, we have, uh, I believe that concludes all in favor of the bill. Yes, great. Thanks, Avery. And um, so next up is uh, Mr. Sagasser from um, DEFS uh, in, against the bill. And um, welcome again, Mr. Sagasser. And uh, apologies for bringing you in too early <laughs> before. <laughs> no problem. Let me just get set up here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Senator Shipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Taxation Committee, good afternoon. My name is John Sagasser. I'm Tax Policy Counsel for the Office of Tax Policy, Main Revenue Services. I'm here today at the request of the administration to testify against LD351, an act regarding municipal valuation and state owned property. The administration is concerned that the bill will create a lot of complexity in the valuation and assessment of state owned properties. There are also numerous legal questions that would need to be clarified. The exemption may have a state constitutional underpinning that should be considered. In addition, partial exemptions should be narrowly framed to align with fair and equal valuation requirements. Further legal research would be required to determine the effects of these issues. Consideration should also be given to the intended classes of property to be covered by the exemption, given the legal difference between the state of Maine and its various instrumentalities. Valuation of certain state property may be very difficult, leading to disputes and uneven application. Also, property may still be exempt under another property tax exemption, for instance, literary and scientific institutions. It's also unclear whether the limited exemption in this bill is intended to exclude state property in the unorganized territory, which is not considered a municipality under the statute. Clarification of legislative intent along with further legal research on that point is necessary. On the technical side, we suggest the term equalized value be changed to just value to avoid administrative difficulty and align with the other property tax exemptions. The preliminary administrative cost for the bill can be observed, absorbed with, within current budgetary allotments. The administration is, looks forward to working with the committee on the bill. Representatives from MRS will be here for the work session to provide additional information and respond in detail to the committee's questions. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have now. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Sachs. I was going to say good morning. Good afternoon, Mr. Sagasser. Um, your testimony actually raised quite a few questions and maybe they will be addressed in the work session. Um, the one I wanted to focus on here was the constitutionality question. Is that something that you can briefly address now? Or again, would you prefer to do all of the issues you raised in the work session? Um, I would just throw a little light, but it does take little research. There's an indication in the case law that uh, there's a, um, a constitutional sovereign immunity for the state. Uh, regardless of any statutory exemption. 
And as such, uh, for the sovereign immunity, there'd be questions about if there would be waiver, what's the manner that would be done, issues of how would enforcement uh, by a town against the state look like, what would be the framework for that? So it, the basic point would be the constitutional immunity, sovereign immunity for the state itself from suit and actions. From paying property tax in this case. Uh, well, yes, b b in twofold, <laughs> I, I, uh, as far as the tax, it, it being taxable and also as to enforcement of a tax obligation. Okay, um, so I'll look forward to the work session for maybe some additional information. Okay. On your testimony, thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Sachs. Any other questions for Mr. Sagasser? Excellent. Thank you very much for your testimony. You're free to join your lunch plate again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so that is it uh, for those against uh, testimony uh, with testimony. Next up is uh, Kate DeFore from MMA who is here to testify neither for nor against. Welcome again. Thank you very much. Representative Terry and members of the Taxation Committee. My name is Kate Dufour. I'm here on behalf of the Maine Municipal Association to provide testimony uh, neither for nor against LD 351. Um, and providing testimony neither for nor against because our policy committee has not established an official position on the bill yet. But in order to prepare for this um, hearing, we did poll our members to get a sense as to where they might land on this particular issue. and. The, um, the results thus far, they're not um, official, but illustrate that our membership is torn and they're torn on two fronts, obviously. The first is with respect to municipal officials understand that there are some communities in the state that have a disproportionate um, amount of state property within their municipal boundaries. They get it. I mean, you. I understand some of the issues were, were, that were raised, but if you look to an Augusta or you look to an Orono, you'll see that they do have disproportionate um, portion of main state property within their borders. So they get it. And, and that's an issue that should be addressed. The, the concern is how will that get addressed? If the state is to, supposed to pay uh, taxes to a few communities, 10, a dozen, whatever it might be, how are they gonna pay for those um, for, the, for those tax assessments. And the concern that the other side of the coin concern from our members is, will that come out of revenues that are already dedicated to municipalities? Are we gonna, you know, what's the phrase, uh, Rob Peter to pay Paul. And there's a concern that those revenues might come from the revenue sharing program, which are now being shared by all communities. So that's, that's where we are at the moment on this particular bill. The policy committee will be taking a full review of it on Thursday, and um, I'm happy to submit follow-up uh, testimony should you find that uh, valuable. Uh, is that this Thursday, Kate? It is. So you'll, you'll be ready to come to see us at the work session with a little more info? Okay. I will. Terrific. Yep. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ms. DeFore? Excellent. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you again, Representative Foster, for sticking with us for so long. Um, you two are free to join your lunch plate. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and that uh, ends this public hearing for um, uh, LD 531. Uh, we have one last thing to go. Uh, LD 149, right, Avery? 146 and um it was ld351 that just said oh did i not say that i'm sorry 531 it's okay I'm sorry i have just the littlest bit of dyslexia not a joke <laughs> um okay uh let's see so um uh ld we have uh peter lacy excellent thank you so much 
Mr. Lacey, thank you for joining us. And again, thank you for staying so long. Um, uh, LD146 has to do with the unorganized territory, correct? You're all set, Mr. Lacey, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, so Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the Taxation Committee, good morning. My name is, or afternoon now, I guess. Sorry, I prepared a uh, testimony earlier. Uh, my name is Peter Lacey. I'm director of the Property Tax Division at Maine Revenue Services. Um, I'm here today at the request of the administration to testify in support of LD 146, the resolve authorizing the state tax assessor to convey the interest of the state in certain real estate in the unorganized territory. So this is an annual agency bill uh, being proposed, which allows the state tax assessor to sell properties that were acquired by the state through the tax lien process. So Title 36, Section 1283 requires that the state tax assessor report to the legislature all property in the unorganized territory that has been tax acquired by the state and after authorization by the legislature to sell that property. Uh, this resolve is a statutory step in that process. Uh, the properties listed in the resolve were acquired by the state through foreclosure of tax liens for non-payment of property taxes. None of the properties, I will note, none of the properties included in this resolve are occupied homesteads. This process is a routine element of an organized territory tax administration and the administrative costs can be absorbed within the current UT budget. The general fund is reimbursed from the Unorganized Territory Education Services Fund for the costs of property tax administration in the unorganized territory. Uh, I will note we're requesting one minor amendment to the bill to reflect some corrected numbers related to one of the properties contained in the resolve. Um, I believe that was sent to Avery earlier, so you hopefully should have it. Um, the administration looks forward to working with the committee on the bill. Representatives from MRS, including myself, will be here for the work session to provide additional information and respond in detail to the committee's questions. Uh, I would be more than happy to respond to any questions you may have now as well. Thank you, Mr. Lacey. Uh, uh, just for, for new members to the committee, um, uh, this is something that we see every year. We are um, part of the um, uh, I guess one of our functions is to make sure that everything in the, we're sort of the tax assessor, I guess not really tax assessors, but we're part of the um, uh, group that makes sure that everything in the UT gets done as a municipality would do. Um, so going through this list, um, which we actually received quite a while ago, you all should have received this in your emails. I'm gonna say at least two weeks ago, Julie can probably, um, tell us a different date if that's if that's not correct. Um, but my question always is, is there somebody living in these homes? And Mr. Lacey, you seem to have address, addressed that already that these are all um, unoccupied at the time at the moment. Um, so my only question is, have you had any um, uh, discussions or disputes with any of the property owners uh, in any of these properties uh, over the course of the year? Um, I mean, we, we spend quite a bit of time reaching out to these taxpayers and um, uh, attempting to, you know, work them with payment plans and get them on track. Um, no, we are not cur currently, a lot of them are ones that we cannot find. Cannot find the property owners. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Lacey? All set. Thank you very much for your testimony. And, Thank you very much. Uh, Avery, do we have anybody else uh, on the list who would like to speak neither for nor against? Nope. All right, terrific. Then uh, we are all done. That closes the public hearing on LD 146. Um, I have nothing. I'm too hungry to think. <laughs> Does anybody have any, any last minute thoughts on the day? <laughs> I move we adjourn. <laughs> Second. Excellent. That's noted. Uh, this uh, meeting.